Good morning, everybody. We are so happy to have everyone here and we'd like to welcome everyone to day one of the Nearshore Restoration Summit and Synthesis. Um, and today we'll be focusing on beaches and we've got presentations starting right now and uh, we'll end at 2.30. My name is Tish conway Cranis, and I'm the science manager for the Estuary and Salmon Restoration Program at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm also the chair of the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program's Near Shore Work Group. I will be your moderator for the day. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered together but apart on Coast Salish ancestral homelands. I am speaking from Olympia, Washington, which occupies the traditional territories of the Squaxin, Nisqually, and Cowlitz peoples, whose ancestors resided here from time immemorial and who still thrive today. We respect and uphold the Coast Salish peoples and sov sovereign tribal nations as knowing bodies and defining partners in our effort to improve the integrity and resilience of ecosystem processes that support environmental and human health and well being. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to see you here in this virtual space. And because we're here on Zoom, I'm just going to share with you some rules of the road for the day. So, first, settle in, enjoy yourself. We have an amazing lineup of speakers, and we just invite you all to um, relax and, um, and engage in this really exciting body of information. Um, give yourself permission, if you can, to unplug from other things. So turn off your email if you can, uh, put, um, turn down your phone and really try to um, give yourself that space to enjoy the day. Um, please use the chat function if you're having a technical problem or have a question for summit organizers. And you can use the Q&A function if you have a question for a speaker. We will be monitoring our team, um, the Q&A and the chat, and we will, we will be allotting time for Q&A after each talk. Um, speakers, please mute yourselves and have your video turned off when you're not speaking so we can focus on the presenter. And speakers will share their screens during uh, the presentations. We've got a backup of everyone's talk today, which is great, but uh, it'll be there um, as, uh, as needed with a technical glitch. Um, um, in general, you'll, you, the speakers, will get to um, control your own screen. Um, I will unmute as your moderator uh, and say in the kindest voice possible, um, two minutes left um, at about 10 minutes into your talk. Um, and then at 12 minutes, I will unmute and play um, a beeping alarm. Uh, so to let you know that it's time to wrap up so we have time um, for questions and time to start the next talk on time. Um, we will have an opportunity for some informal interactions and this we're calling the Wonder Lounge or the Beach Lounge today. Um, and I'll tell you more about it when we get closer to the break, but uh, it's a time that we are not facilitating or orchestrating in any way as organizers. We're just allowing everyone to um, interact with each other uh, and have fun in a virtual space. So hopefully um, that will be great. Um, and then I just wanted to um, open up some, some meeting principles that we've, that we've uh, thought about for today. And that is we've invited a, a group of speakers um, that, that represent um, um, a diversity of perspectives, and we want to um, collectively create a space that is respectful and open to all of these perspectives and ways of knowing. So we have a special thanks for our steering committee. Um, um, this uh, amazing group of people has really helped us to define the questions for the summit and to create a vision for the structure and makeup of the summit that you see. So um, we thank you so much. Uh, we thank Ron Thom, Megan Detier, Jennifer Griffiths, Devin Smith, Chris Ellings, Simone Desroches, Doris Small, Sydney Fishman, Don Pucci, and Paul Cherigino uh, for the uh, wonderful input that we've had uh, in putting this summit together. Um, we are also here today, thanks to the hard work of this awesome group of people, um, the summit planning team. Um, and we are all here today um, making sure that everything goes smoothly be behind the scenes. So we have Lindsay Desmuel, Jenna Jewett, Darren Williams, Hannah Faulkner, myself, um, and my cat, she's right over there, um, and uh, David Trimbach, Jay Kranitz, and Jason Toft. So um, the day, this is sort of the overall the overview for the entire summit. Um, today and tomorrow, we have beaches. Next Wednesday and Thursday, we have deltas. And then um, the 24th and 25th, we'll have two days of talks um, about um, embayments. Uh, 
Um, this is sort of our organizational system. So um, lots of opportunities to engage. Um, and then I feel just so humbled uh, um, and inspired by the amazing group of speakers that we have um, lined up to, to speak to you throughout the course of this summit. We have 78 individuals from over 50 organizations and entities, including state, local, regional, federal, tribal, nonprofit, private, and academic. So a, re a real um, smattering of people. And um, we are just uh, so um, excited about this um, uh, makeup. And we, um, we want you to know that we individually invited each speaker uh, to reflect contributions from natural scientists, from restoration practitioners and planners, from social scientists, including diversity, equity, and inclusion experts, um, and, and to really help us think about how we can incorporate these principles into our restoration work. So how did we get here? Um, the idea for this summit really started from conversations um, between um, the PSEMP um, Nearshore Work Group and um, WDFW's um, Estuarine Salmon Restoration Program. And so uh, conversations between me and Jay Krenitz, the ESRP Program Manager, and Jason Toft, the coordinator of the PSEMP Nearshore Work Group. We just started talking about bringing together this group of, of practitioners and scientists. And we started talking to David Trimbach and including social science into this mix. And um, this, and every time we talked about it, people around us would get really excited. Uh, we, and so uh, this idea has been incubating for um, at least a couple of years. And we really thank PSEMP for giving us the funding to help um, make it happen. So, um, so, Part of the um, foundation of the Estuarine Salmon Restoration Project is with the Puget Sound Nearshore Ecosystem Restoration Project, or PISNERP. And this was a partnership between the Army Corps of Engineers and WDFW that created a 20-year science investigation and series of technical reports, identifying different kinds of habitats and geomorphologies in Puget Sound, the, phil the philosophical principles for restoration, historic change analysis, and strategic recommendations for restoration and protection. This was a huge body of work that has laid the groundwork for the Estuarine Salmon Restoration Program and for the science that it continues to move forward. Um, the um, um, the Pisner uh, proper project has now a feasibility report and congressional approval for 12 projects. And the Estuarine Salmon Restoration Program was created um, fairly early on in the Pisner project to start doing restoration according to the science principles that the project was identifying. And then we recently acquired the Shore Friendly Program, which is really awesome. And, uh, and we are um, excited to have several speakers um, today and tomorrow that will speak to that. So one of the foundational um, principles of um, the Estuarian Salmon Restoration Program that was identified in the Pisner Project was this fundamental relationship between habitat forming processes, the structure that these processes form on the landscape, and ecosystem functions that are connected to that process, uh, to that structure. And really trying to, when we think about restoration, address the source of impairment of the habitat forming process, rather than say building a habitat to meet the needs of a, a specific species. So really trying to look back and say, what are the habitat forming processes and what is the source of impairment to those processes? So um, what do we mean when we say process? Um, wh what we really are saying is what processes maintain this physical landscape that we see. So we see this interconnected set of diverse habitats we have river deltas, salt marshes, mudflats, bays, beaches, kelp and eelgrass beds, rocky shores, lagoons. And we wanna ask ourselves, what are the processes maintaining this landscape? So we can think about sediment input from rivers or from eroding bluffs, sediment transport, once it's in the system, it has to go somewhere. Tidal flow is an important habitat forming process, process erosion, um, accretion, uh, freshwater input, fresh, freshwater input, Detritus input and export, which is my personal favorite, um, is a really important um, engine for uh, um, really important process um, in these ecosystems, the exchange of aquatic organisms, and solar incidents. So, so these are the kinds of processes that we're referring to when we talk about habitat farming processes. So an example of this really simplified um, is um, how we might think about beach restoration. Um, we have a restoration action. In this case, it would be um, bulkhead removal. Um, we might expect to see a suite of restored processes as a result of that uh, bulkhead removal, and then some structural changes that we can measure on the landscape 
um, as a result of those processes, and then some kind of functional response, um, like increase in habitat for animals or resilience to sea level rise. Um, so this is a, a, a very simplified version, but they help to us to understand both what to expect um, when we do restoration and also how best to target our restoration actions. And it's these models that we have asked um, the researchers who are contributing to the summit to take a look at and see whether their work helps to inform or change or add nuance to these, this conceptual understanding of these relationships. Um, and we have a great body of work um, later today um, that has done just that um, with their research. So another um, sort of key thing um, from the Pisner project that we've adopted into the summit is organizing um, the landscape um, by geomorphic shore form. Um, so deltas, we identify these as the um, largest, um, the largest river deltas um, in Puget Sound. So places where the 16, specifically 16 largest rivers, um, freshwater rivers meet the salty waters of Puget Sound forming this tidal wetland habitat. Um, coastal inlets, oh my goodness, okay, I'm just gonna click all the way. Ah, oh, weird. Okay, coastal inlets, which I don't have a picture of, are little mini deltas. Um, uh, and there are many more of them around Puget Sound. Barrier embayments are, um, are tidal wetland habitats that have um, some kind of a barrier in front of them. And collectively, we call these embayments. And then beaches, um, there are many more of them in Puget Sound, and they typically consist of a, a, a source of sediment, a transport zone, and some kind of um, accretion place. And, and the key to the, the reason that we think about these um, as separate is that they are reliant on different kinds of processes. So we can think about an increasing importance of sediment supply and transport as we go from deltas to beaches and an increasing reliance on freshwater inputs as we go from beaches to deltas. It's kind of oversimplified, but just recognizing that the processes are different. Um, we know that, uh, so we, we organized our summit this way, but we know that not everyone's research um, or projects uh, fits into this construct. And um, we invite everyone to sort of uh, um, ex accept that there's that there's a useful way to organize um, the landscape and the work, but that there's, there's some, some, um, some work that, that doesn't fit perfectly. So the estuary and salmon restoration program has three major, has two major components. 90% um, of our funding goes to uh, process-based restoration and protection in Puget Sound, and 10% goes to research investigations um, that inform restoration. And many of the research projects um, that we'll hear about over the summit um, have been supported by this work. And so when we think about this goal of, of connecting science and restoration, we, we can think about the learning part. So thinking about uh, ecosystem response uh, to restoration or developing a tool to help plan or implement restoration. This then needs to be communicated um, and then reassessed and then ultimately incorporated into restoration projects. And we see this nearshore restoration summit and synthesis as being um, a really important um, way to connect the parts of this triangle and really strengthen the, this relationship between science and restoration practice. So we have several um, uh, broad uh, and ambitious um, summit objectives, and, um, and we really are bringing everyone together to, um, to try to move these forward, knowing that we, that we won't necessarily be solving everything with, with one um, summit and proceedings. So um, first, we want to just synthesize the nearshore restoration science um, in Puget Sound for the last 10 years capture insights um, uh, from restoration practice um, by inviting practitioners and planners to speak about their experiences, identify the most important science and management questions that will guide future actions as best we can, update the, the PISNERP conceptual models for the ecosystem response to restoration and thinking about restoration um, uh, where apl applicable, and then incorporate um, social science principles, um, including diversity, equity, and inclusion into the way that we think about restoration so that we can incorporate these principles into our work. So what we did to get at this is that we asked, uh, we, we had these three groups of spe speakers and we asked each one a different set of questions. So we invited individuals and we said, we would like you to speak in our summit and contribute to our proceedings. And we also want you to think about these specific questions. So for natural scientists, we asked, what are the key implications of your research for planning or implementing process-based restoration? For you, what are the most important uncertainties to address with future restoration that will result in more effective restoration? And then lastly, how does your work inform or improve upon Pisner conceptual models for restoration? 
For social scientists, we asked, what is your social science field or area of expertise contribute or add value to planning or restoration? What are the major social science gaps and needs that you observe or observe, experience within your field or area? And what needs to be done for you and your research to better um, be integrated into practitioners or natural science researchers work? So really trying to integrate this. And then for the practitioners uh, and planners, we ask, what have you learned through your experience with project development, design and implementation that informs the needs of future restoration? And for you, what are the most important scientific uncertainties, either in natural or social science, that limit planning, design, implementing, um, or evaluating nearshore restoration? So these were, these were the questions that um, each of the speakers that you see today um, were sort of given um, as they helped them develop their talks. And then this is awesome. We've got some great speakers. And, um, and the point is that we, what we see is a blend and we've really tried to integrate across these disciplines as we've created this program. Not every day is um, as well integrated as this, uh, as far as um, blending the, the kinds of speakers, but we've really uh, tried to um, uh, uh, break down silos and bring, bring everyone together. So um, what we wanna do is bring together restoration scientists, practitioners and the summit um, to share what we've learned, the questions that we have and chart a course for the next generation of restoration and research using um, with our proceedings, and then share this with the restoration community uh, and anyone who, whose work might be informed by this. So um, we're really, really excited about this effort and I'm really grateful for uh, our steering committee and our planning committee and also um, all of the wonderful speakers who are contributing to this. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Hugh Shipman. And so I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so that Hugh can share it. And um, so Hugh is retired from the Washington Department of Ecology in 2019. And after 30 years as a, as a coastal geologist, his interests include the geomorphology of Puget Sound beaches, the impacts of shoreline modifications, and the geologic aspects of coastal restoration, he was a member of the Pisner Nearshore Science Team and contributed to several reports on nearshore processes and restoration. He has helped ESRP on both program and strategy and the review of individual restoration projects. For 12 years, he posted photos and beach of beaches on his Gravel Beach blog, though since his retirement, he's really slacked off his words. Um, um, Hugh received his BA from Dartmouth in 1981 and his MS from the University of Washington in 1986. And he's been spending his retirement um, on his bike and in his wood shop. And Hugh's voice and expertise have made huge contributions to beach restoration science and practice. And there are so many of us who are so grateful to have had him as a teacher, mentor, and friend. And we're so glad that we can occasionally still draw him back into this world, including as part of the Shore Friendly YouTube series, which you should check out. So with that, I will give you Hugh Shipman. And Hugh, if you wanna start um, sharing your screen uh, and you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right, first Tish, can you hear me? I can, you sound great. And, but you probably don't see my screen yet, do you? Not yet. That's because I jumped two steps ahead as mm -hmm. usual, just a second here. Just a second, apologize, didn't get this quite right. Share no screen. No worries. Okay. Share screen. And if I could get rid of my Zoom bar, I could get to my... So what's, are you, do you have my screen? Yep, yep, it looks great, Hugh. Great, great, okay. So I was sort of, I, I appreciate being asked to, to come and chat with folks. I wish I could be there with all of you. Um, I miss I miss you all. Uh, so I thought I'd try to provide a brief, a little bit of a context, a little bit of ancient history here. Some of it um, Tish has already alluded to, and I'll try to do this fairly efficiently. Uh, my ancient history begins in uh, the 70s and the 80s, very briefly here. Uh, we were doing beach restoration in the 1970s and 80s, not we, others, I wasn't even on the scene, uh, but we probably had a very different sensibility about it. We wanted to improve the environment, but most of it was being done fairly specifically to improve usually um, recreational opportunities in public parks and so forth. Um, I like this particular example because we're looking at one of the largest beach restoration projects on Puget Sound. This is the South Beach at West Point in Seattle and next to the treatment plant. It was done in 1980. 
Um, this was all riprap. There was a sewage lagoon that extended out below low tide on the right of this photograph. It was all riprap. That was all taken out. And there are little issues around the corners, but it's an interesting example of what we were doing in another era. Uh, so that just, that's the ancient part. By the 80s and the 90s, there was an awful lot of interest in bulkheads. There was a recognition, not just here on Puget Sound, but around the country, that bulkheads and seawalls were a problem. Um, they may serve purposes, but they also had environmental impacts and, and a number of others as well. In the early 90s, Ecology did a fairly large project um, looking at the environmental impacts and sort of the cumulative impacts of armoring on Puget Sound. It really, I think, increased awareness. It got folks like Ron Thom and Trina Wellman and folks at Battelle sort of involved in the process. And I think it really sort of elevated interest at the time. We had regulations, but they didn't, I don't think our toolbox was really well tuned to dealing with it as a cumulative impact issue. The small scale stuff was hard to deal with. Uh, since then, I think the amount of science we've got to work with has increased immensely. Our understanding of the extent and the distribution of armoring on Puget Sound is much, much better than it was. One of the things that I think we really come to appreciate in the last few years, it's a little difficult to wrap our heads around is that the current rates of armoring are fairly low. Um, and so it reminds us that much of the problem that we're dealing with is a legacy of past practices. It doesn't mean there's not a role for regulation moving forward, but really the restoration community has the most opportunities to do good, I think. Nearshore, geologists and oceanographers define it a little differently. It's, the term's been around for a long time, but we sort of co-opted it here in the 90s. Um, I will blame or give credit, frankly, to people like Jenny Broadhurst at the Action Team, who I think were the first ones who started using the term nearshore to describe this broad band of ecological and geological activity along the shoreline. Um, in the 70s, Wolf Bauer was calling this the shore process corridor, but it was the same basic concept. And it was a recognition that everything from the top of the bluffs or the sort of headed tide all the way out to sort of where things drop off into deep water was an important part of the overall environment of the system. Uh, I think that the other thing that came along with recognition of nearshore was simply a recognition that this was an important part of the Puget Sound ecosystem. Um, so in around 2000, um, we'd, we were now talking about the nearshore a lot. Um, we were thinking a lot about bulkheads and what to do about them. We were doing a few restoration projects. I'll keep coming back to that, but not a new thing. But a bunch of uh, sort of high level people and the pol political circles at King County and the state started talking to the Corps of Engineers with the notion of developing a general investigation around the Puget Sound nearshore. Um, I think initially it was probably seen as sort of more of a sub-regional effort. King County had an important part of this, uh, but it moved fairly quickly once it got started. Um, there were a lot of people I should probably credit for having been part of that. Um, but it was about developing a general investigation, which is not a project in and of itself. Uh, but there was at the same time, because it was King County and because of some work done by what was called the Nearshore Technical Team within King County, Colin's probably listening in, um, there was interest in specific projects. And one of the big low hanging fruit at the time was Seahurst Park in Burien. Uh, and bottom line is it wasn't funded specifically by Pisner. Pisner wasn't ready for that, but it was funded basically because of Pisner, the core money, um, King County working together. And in 2005, the south part of that project was done. It's sort of a symbolic project in the restoration story. The north end of the park, which is an equally interesting but very different project, wasn't done until about 10 years later. This is just a before and after of the same spot along there. Uh, Tish has mentioned this, the Puget Sound Nearshore project was basically under the auspices of a general investigation. It was all about documenting the need to do large scale restoration. It wasn't about at least initially doing the projects themselves, but in the process, we, various committees and groups within it, um, the community as a whole developed an awful lot of good guidance materials uh, in, on everything from individual ecosystem components, forage fish, beaches, um, to 
more strategic types of documents, a lot of restoration guidance and so forth. And I think those documents and the knowledge that came out of that is still really important to everything we do today. <clears throat> Pisner contributed two, well, con Pisner contributed a lot of things, but there were two things I wanted to call attention to. One of, and both of which Tish has mentioned. One of which is Pisner decided that it made sense to organize our restoration strategy around landforms. Different landforms are driven by different, are formed and maintained by different processes. They are impaired in different ways. The solutions are different. And it really sort of makes sense to divide the world up a little bit. It doesn't mean there aren't fascinating interactions between these different geomorphic systems, but that's really why we have a summit today on beaches. And next week, there's a summit on deltas. If you put us all in the same room, it would probably be hard to get much traction. So one thing is we focused on landforms and in this case on beaches. The other thing was this mantra about process-based restoration, that it wasn't enough to simply create habitat for a specific species or to create a beach that looked like a beach, you really had to create something that functioned and operated that way, that the underlying processes were still intact or were restored. Uh, for me as a geomorphologist, I think it's always important to realize that processes occur at a wide variety of scales. And I just throw this one photo out because it shows a really typical upper beach. And there's a lot of local spatial variability and really it's driven by a lot of temporal variability which affects the disturbance regime for the ecology and so on and so forth. Uh, this is, beaches are very simple at this level. Beaches are all about waves and tides to some extent acting on move, mobile sand and gravel. They're very, very simple concept. But as we move up in scale, you'll see beaches take on a lot of different forms. Uh, so while beaches are important here, what's really probably more important and something Pisner really sort of focused on was thinking about geomorphic processes at a landscape scale. In the case of beaches, yes, it's all about waves moving gravel. But what happens in an hour or a storm in aggregate changes the entire coastline. Geologists, we have a lot of time for these multiple storms, multiple years, hundreds of years. Things change. And over time, all those small movements of material lead to big changes in the shoreline. And the process that we've really focused on is the longshore, the movement along the coastline of sediment, longshore drift. There's a lot of terminology. Uh, and because what that does over time is it basically creates new habitat. It creates new structure along the shoreline. So in this particular example up at Alice Fit on Skagit Bay, northeast side of Whidbey Island, this is at this picture is taken at the, the right hand end, the north end of several miles of continuous beach. The sediment in this spit came from somewhere else. But as this spit formed, it created fundamentally different kinds of coastal systems. It's basically a small estuary mar tidal marsh on the backside, but only 10, 20 meters to the south, you have an exposed beach. Very different habitats and creates a very complex restoration scenario. Catch up with my scribbles here. Uh, not gonna talk an awful lot about beach restoration projects specifically, but I wanted to make a few sort of comments. Um, one of which is, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've been doing these for a long time. We may call them something different. We may conceive of them different and they all look different. My favorite theme. Uh, but even as Pisner developed, there were plenty of interesting restoration projects going on. Um, Pisner though was starting, especially by about 2010, 2011, starting to actually identify projects, specific places in the landscape. Many of those had already been identified by local groups who were doing this kind of work. Uh, and then eventually ESRP was formed basically to make these kinds of projects easier to happen, um, provide funding and support and so forth using those PISNERP concepts, but recognizing that PISNERP itself wasn't going to do these projects as an entity really. Uh, and so uh, there just, there's a lot of these. Um, we'll hear about many more of them today. And uh, probably the most, for me, the most, I'll come back to this most fascinating aspect of these is just the diversity of these kinds of projects. 
beach projects are hard. I mean, every restoration project is hard, but I think there's some particular characteristics that make beach projects really challenging. Um, and there's there are a number, but one of which is very simple one is beach property is very expensive. Um, the projects themselves are often very small. And oftentimes it's very hard to define the benefits in a very clear way. And it makes it really difficult to justify the costs of acquiring or doing an expensive project on a small parcel. It's not like just putting a hole in a dike and creating a hundred acres of tidal marsh. You don't get quite the same effect when you do beach projects. Uh, part of that reflects the fact that much of the impact on beaches, much of the impairment to beaches is a cumulative impact problem. And that means that solutions and restoration are almost inevitably going to be incremental. I used to think of it as sort of cumulative impacts, cumulative benefits. And so restoration needs to be seen as a stepwise process. We just need to keep doing it, be optimistic and realize that we are making things better. We're not going to just pull out one bulkhead and solve the whole problem for three miles of shoreline, at least not, in the, not immediately. Um, there are a couple other issues. Restoring process, restoring geomorphic process is a bit of a challenge on coastal sites. Um, geomorphic process is erosion, it's landslides, it's flooding, all those things that nobody wants. Property owners don't want it, and the people who are funding these projects are nervous about it. And that means that sometimes we don't pick the best projects because the risks are very high. Sometimes the best projects are the ones that are really maybe less ecological value. I see Tish's picture coming back on my screen, which either means my screen woke up or Tish is telling me I've run out of time. Um, the other aspect about these projects is that inevitably they are opportunistic. And we're struggling with that. Then maybe that's the reality of these projects, but we need to figure out how to take advantage of the fact that there are just an awful lot of small opportunities. They come in lots of flavors. This has always been what's fascinated me the most about restoration. Neither of these is an ESRP project in and of itself, though there are some overlap. Um, this is to two very, very different projects, both of which one could argue restore geomorphic process at some scale but they are entirely different sites. They're both about waves and tides moving sand and gravel, but they don't look the same. The scale's different, the context is completely different. Uh, let's see, I think I'm almost done, Tish. So I just wanted to wrap up and say, there's been an awful lot of projects done. People who've worked with me know that one of my challenges, and I never really resolved this, was figuring we really just needed to understand better the, the number of these things that was going on and start to learn better from some of the projects that have been done in the past. Um, an awful lot of us work in our little local cells. We do some really cool stuff, or we're in Olympia and we look at the big picture, but it's amazing how much stuff is actually happening out on the ground. Um, they all look really different. Some of them are working better than others, but we don't really know. And I think we're still struggling on how best to evaluate that. Uh, and my final comment is when I started in the 19, early 1990s, I saw pretty early that we would probably cut down on the number of new bulkheads. I never imagined at that time that we would be pulling out as many bulkheads as we are. And to me, that is one of the coolest things to have seen. And so I'm looking forward to hearing I'm leaving the what's next on this slide for everyone else, because I'm not quite sure, but I, I'm optimistic. Awesome, Hugh, thank you so much. We are just um, so uh, delighted that we can hear from you today. And uh, thank you. So our next, next speaker is George Kaminsky from the Washington Department of Ecology. And George, you um, can start sharing your screen. The title of George's talk is Mapping the Physical Indicators of Beach Processes, Structure, and Function. And uh, Karen Stralioff, uh, you are on deck. If you wanna kind of start, start uh, getting ready. And, um, and George, I'll, I'll let you know when, there's, um, when you're 10 minutes into your talk. Thanks so much. Great, can you see my screen okay? -ish? Yep, we can see you and hear you. Great, let me see, how do I, I don't see my own, what I'm looking for though. <laughs> Sorry, just one second. Somehow it's not showing. 
Um, okay, well, let's just start. Let's see if this works. Um, I want to acknowledge the ESRP program as um, providing the bulk of the support for the work I'll show in this presentation, which has been accomplished by the CMAP team at the Department of Ecology. Um, yeah, I'm not able to advance here very well. Um, we commonly see a stark difference in the beach environment uh, between immediately adjacent and armored and natural shorelines throughout Puget Sound. And this is qualitatively obvious. Here you can see the shade, large woody debris, backshore zone in the natural setting and the lack of that in the uh, modified setting. Generally, it's complex in the natural and very sterile environment in the, in the modified of each. Um, but quantitatively, this has not been well inventoried and measured. And um, the location, character, and impact of the shoreline armoring uh, varies greatly throughout the sound. Um, oops. So um, on the more benign side, some of the shoreline armor is in more form of landscaping than erosion control. And these kinds of armoring can potentially be viewed as good candidates for removal since there's low risk to upland property. However, to keep in mind is that if the armor has very little interaction with coastal processes, then the armor removal would result in minimal restoration of processes structure and function. Um, this is an example of a high and dry con concrete bulkhead well above and behind the high water tide line. Uh, note the adjacent house with the significant accumulation of drift logs and backshore vegetation fronting the location of the bulkhead. Another example of a setback bulkhead with an extensive accumulation of large woody debris behind the high tide line. And note the expanse of um, dry back beach above the, uh, the wet uh, area below. Here's a more modest example with accumulated sediment and drift logs with the backshore vegetation fronting the concrete bulkhead. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, is a highly intrusive walls that significantly oppose on the shoreline, resulting in a depressed beach profile and typically coarse sediments. Uh, often this kind of armor is considered essential to protecting upland property and therefore is maintained through repairs and replacement of the kind um, as, with the light kind as needed. Unfortunately, soft solutions may not even be considered without actually really exploring technical, technically feasible alternatives. So, if the armor is having a large impact, why are we not restoring those sites? Um, often imposing armor such as this will appear to reach out onto the lower beach face and, and, but note the adjacent structures that are more set back with higher beach level across the toe of the structure. There's a backshore zone uh, with drift logs adjacent to this house on the right um, where uh, the backshore exists. Uh, quite readily, whereas it's, it's completely um, missing in the middle part of the, of the screen here. So is this an erosion problem or an encroachment problem? I, I see this particular example as probably more of an encroachment problem than erosion. Oops. Um, uh, um, even at high tide, um, you can see the, the, or you can see the high tide line on this particular seawall uh, which is a couple feet higher than the toe of the structure. And the beach environment is barren, void of uh, driftwood, rack, and, and any real complexity. I don't need to comment on this slide. I'll just let you soak up the scenery. So in order to restore shorelines and evaluate the effectiveness of restoration actions, we need to measure and monitor natural shorelines to have a reference to know how the restored shoreline compares to a regionally appropriate natural intact condition. Um, shown here is um, an example of measuring the shoreline landscape with LIDAR technology with a 3D classified point cloud on the right, highlighting large woody debris shown here in brown from the beach topography in beige color, from the shoreline armor shown in white and the riparian vegetation shown in green. When we measure key shoreline features, we can improve restoration. That's my hypothesis. In 
In our case, we use boat-based LiDAR to obtain comprehensive, high-resolution, three-dimensional, quantitative geospatial data along the shoreline at, lands at the scale of uh, entire drift cells. The shoreline landscape is scanned in a vertical pattern from a laser scanner mounted on the vessel with a high-end uh, position and orientation system, the black box that corrects for vessel, vessel motion in real time. Um, the, the result is a uh, three-dimensional point cloud that um, really shows all of the landscape features. And it can be uh, rotated in a 3D uh, space to look at the features from different angles. And points in the point cloud can be classified or colored in different groupings to help us isolate different features and quantify the features in the landscape. So here I'll step through the key shoreline features which we are interested in mapping and quantifying uh, in, along the shoreline. First is the mean higher high water line, the bluff toe, the back beach width, the armor toe, armor encroachment, overhanging vegetation, and large woody debris. The back beach or back shore width provides a platform for coastal vegetation and large woody debris accumulation, microhabitats, nutrients, and service such as refuge, foraging, spawning, roosting, and nesting. In the case of uh, encroached armor, the concrete boat ramp shown here is the only form of back beach that exists. So that's the only place large woody debris can deposit. Large woody debris provide an invertebrate habitat, enhance sediment deposition, and dissipate wave energy. We can quantify the large woody debris with a classified point cloud. Overhanging vegetation oops, provides organic matter, refuge, food, and cover for both terrestrial and marine organisms, and moderates beach temperature and moisture important to surf smelt spawning. The vegetation overhang is important in context with the range of beach, um, with the range of beach elevation below it to determine the relative contribution to um, terrestrial and marine environments. <clears throat> Armor encroachment reduces the back beach width, large weighted reaccumulation, coastal vegetation, habitats, and services. Boat-based LIDAR is ideal for measuring the um, encroached armor because it efficiently records the variability and elevation of the armor toe along the shoreline, as the armor is often does not follow the natural contours of the beach. The armor toe is easily identified in the lighter point cloud. And we can consider the encroachment with a horizontal distance from the back edge of the beach, such as the natural buff toe, or simply consider the vertical distance of the armor below the mean higher high water line. Um, Megan's big armoring paper of 2016 found that the vertical, vertical encroachment, which they termed relative encroachment, resulted in decline of logs, rack, and vertebrates on the beach when the vertical distance between the mean higher high water line and the armor toe was greater than 1.4 feet. <clears throat> um, we can use this uh, 1.4 feet as a criteria um, for evaluation of potential uh, restoration projects and the uh, ability to provide uh, restoration of, of process. As a result of measuring um, key shoreline features, a selection of, of sites with adjacent armored and natural shorelines, we can quantify their differences. At this Maury Island reach, the natural shoreline has a wider beach and back beach. It's significantly more large woody debris and vegetation overhang. A similar result- George, I'm yeah. gonna give you just your two minute warning. You, uh, yeah, thanks so much. Okay. A similar result is found at this beach south of Seahurst Park in Durian. Another similar result uh, found at this uh, reach at Edgewater Beach. And when we, um, uh, combined measurements from all sites, 
The natural shorelines had significantly more back beach width, large weighted debris and vegetation overhang compared to the armored shorelines. Conducting successive LIDAR surveys allows us to measure changes over time. And in this case, measured, we measure changes associated with the bulkhead removal project. This is at uh, Edgewater Beach. <clears throat> uh, following the, the removal of the bulkhead, we found that the lower bluff supplied sediment to the beach and large weighted debris increased and enhanced sediment deposition. Note the pattern of sediment deposition up on the updraft side of the large weighted debris shown by the blue colors. So there's process steps that I, uh, that I think are um, relevant to um, taking the data we collect to uh, restoration outcomes. First, uh, inventory and quantify physical features to provide a reference for restoration and measure the difference between modified and natural shorelines. Second, develop metrics for assessment of condition and restoration potential. Third, document the linkages between physical features and biological functions. Four, map changes over time to understand and restore processes and functions. Five, mimic natural structure and integrate natural dynamics with restoration actions. I'd like to talk a lot, a lot more about that with soft shore um, approaches. Six, monitor restoration actions, actions for effectiveness and compare to natural reference conditions. So the summary take home message here, when we measure key shoreline features, we can improve restoration. Thanks very much for your time and I hope there's some questions and lots of discussion later on. Thank you. Awesome, George, thanks so much. Um, nice work uh, coming in on the perfect time. I didn't have to do my dinger because you got it just right. Um, so I think we have time for one question while we transition over to Karen. And uh, just to let you know, David uh, Trimbach, you're on deck after Karen. Um, so Jenna, do, would you like to, um, uh, uh, facilitate mm -hmm. one question while we do the, the transition? Yep, absolutely. So uh, Francesca Perez asks, has ecology considered mapping uh, the HTL, which I'm assuming is high tide line um, or level with sea level rise and recent core jurisdiction changes? It seems this would be more relevant, especially as time goes on. Well, in terms of uh, mapping, we can, we can choose any um, tidal elevation that we want. I, you know, the, when we have the, when we're doing the, based on boat-based LIDAR, we're surveying the entire uh, beach face and we can choose whatever elevation we'd like to, to map and keep track of. We've done the mean higher high water line as a, as a reference, um, but we can track any elevation contour along the shoreline. Um, and that's just a, a matter of choice and, and can be done pretty readily. Okay, awesome. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, but um, if other people have questions for George, uh, please still put them into the into the Q and A, and we will uh, record those as sort of part of the proceedings or the documents that um, that we use to inform the proceedings for this. And I'll also put in a plug for our Wonder Lounge later, uh, where you can find George and just ask him. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. And um, I will be um, happy to introduce our next speaker, Karen Strelia from the Thurston Conservation District. So um, Karen, if you would like to start sharing your screen, great, I see it's coming. And the title of Karen's talk is Messy is Beautiful, Isn't It? Understanding Homeowner Responses to Shoreline, Shoreline Restoration and Stewardship Goals. Uh, take it away, Karen. Sorry, I, I was muted. All righty. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, I'm, I was going to say, I think you're muted. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm honored and grateful for this opportunity to share my thoughts, um, particularly because I'm one of the newer practitioners in this area of restoration and research. And so um, I'll just get rolling. So when I saw this landslide during a site visit, I saw it as a sign of a healthy shoreline, uh, the natural process of coastal erosion that helps to build and maintain our Puget Sound beaches. But if you were the homeowner that lives above this mess, uh, you, you might very well be terrified. So preparing this talk offered me a rare moment for reflection about the messiness that I really think is beautiful. For the past six years, I've been working as part of this shore friendly initiative, which is a multi partner effort to work with waterfront homeowners around Puget Sound. A main focus of shore friendly is to change behavior within the waterfront community, and especially to help homeowners avoid hard armor or remove it where it's feasible, 
in order to help preserve crucial coastal processes and near shore habitats. Now, as part of this effort, I do two things. I try to cultivate an ethic of stewardship on marine shorelines, and then I also help to design and implement restoration projects. With my partners in the South Sound at Pierce and Mason Conservation Districts, we visited more than 240 waterfront homeowners in this past six years. And I thought as we helped people to understand the messy processes and ecology of the near shore, that people would come to fear change a little bit less and that they might even come to appreciate erosion uh, as part of the natural complexity of the near shore that helps to maintain their beaches. But I am finding that there still remains a, a very real difference between what stewardship and restoration means for practitioners like myself and what it means for uh, these homeowners who are living on and in managing these very dynamic waterfront landscapes. So I'm finding that to be successful with stewardship and restoration at the residential waterfront scale, we really need to factor in human considerations almost as much as coastal processes and nearshore ecology. So I'll start by exploring a few of the differences in perception that I think influence dominant stewardship practices. Um, many of them are transported to the marine shoreline from urban and suburban communities. As someone who adores that messy, the messy layers of life that we find on our beaches, it's, it's easy for me to dismiss norms like those seen here, right? I struggle to see this shoreline as um, something other than degraded or as a demonstration of ecological poverty. But um, as members of a human community, these homeowners see that their waterfront lawns are meticulously cared for, that they've preserved the views which reflect their deep connection to the Puget Sound. And as Aldo Leopold said in a different context, um, the landscape of any farm is the owner's portrait of himself. And I think for many waterfront landowners, they see the same thing. So as a restoration practitioner, I, I look at this overhanging vegetation on a beach as crucial, right? For shade, for the contribution of detritus and many other things. I see, a, I see a downed tree as a natural contribution of wood that's helping to build habitat and, and uh, the geomorphology of the beaches. Um, it's a sign of healthy complexity in the nearshore system. But very often homeowners see these same things as signs of neglect. And they wonder whether they need to remove the tree or even to clean the beach of pickleweeds so that their neighbors know it is cared for. I look at this exposed and sandy bank as a place that provides homes for bluff nesting birds and, and burrowing bees. Um, but the debris beneath this bluff appeared messy and really disordered to the homeowner who was walking beside me. So I have to remind myself that we come from a history that strives towards order and certainty, and that those impulses are deeply ingrained signs of caring, not deliberate rejections of environmental concerns. Um, the design of our cities and our suburbs have created a culture of straight lines and defined boundaries, open vistas, and broad lawns. But I think that's where these uh, shore-friendly technical assistance site visits really can come into play as we, as we work to try to help homeowners imagine and adopt a different way of thinking about the shoreline and a different way of living on the shoreline. So we all agree now, right? Messy is beautiful. Well, I want to take a, a look at restoration implementation next and how homeowners are responding to these projects. And so, you know, I, I anticipated that cultivating a new stewardship ethic perspective um, among waterfront homeowners would immediately translate into restoration projects that would look a lot like those messy shorelines that I love. So here's an example of a restoration site on Pickering Passage, and this is the bulkhead and, and beach debris uh, that was removed. Here's what it looks like afterwards. And the homeowner, who's a microbiologist by training and, and a wonderful person who cares really deeply about restoring the health of Puget Sound, recently reached out to ask if she needs to do something to fix the bank. Her comment was, it, it looks so messy. I'm not sure it would be an incentive for anyone to remove their bulkhead. I've been concerned that this bank looks like it is badly eroding instead of a gentle beach. So here again, we're seeing this, this sort of stubborn difference in perception um, surfacing despite the many conversations that I had with this homeowner about how the site would change and that erosion would resume. 
I see this as a shoreline that's allowed to evolve over time in response to changing conditions, but my homeowner sees what appears to be disorder and neglect. And you know, as a literal embodiment of shoreline change, erosion is deeply unsettling in its visibility and its immediacy. Homeowners don't find it neat at all. So a very popular site, I, I, I must say. Um, here's another example of, of a bulkhead removal site before restoration. And here it is afterwards. And again, I see this as an example of um, excellent restoration work. And, and George just testified to this. Natural processes are free to resume after the, after the wall was removed. But you know, I'm starting to ask myself, how is this homeowner community going to respond to this? Um, you know, thankfully, I think this is a, a residential property and, and these homeowners have embraced the change. But for many people, um, this is going to take a little bit more of a, a a little more time. <laughs> and so this is this conversation is, is all about reminding us that one of the greatest challenges facing waterfront restoration at the residential scale really remains this problem of striking a viable balance between restoration actions that support coastal processes and ecological diversity, and then homeowner needs to feel security and stability, a tangible connection to the water, and some sense of control within an inherently uh, dynamic environment. So here's another example of a bulkhead removal project before the wall was taken out. And here's uh, the example after the, the bulkhead was uh, removed. And, and this example is really highly appealing to many waterfront homeowners. It has a lot of familiar qualities. It has those clean lines and defined edges, a wide open vista, stable materials integrated into it, like stone, and it's got lots of lawn. This appears to be a very well-managed waterfront, and that is really reassuring. But of course, as a restoration practitioner and a fondness uh, with a fondness for messy landscapes, you know I'm worried about the lack of overhanging riparian vegetation. Um, and I, I would bet that the project designers tried very hard to integrate trees and shrubs into this project, but I would also guess that the homeowners weren't ready for that much change. So I wanna be really clear about this point. You know, I don't see that any of these armor removal projects are, are disappointments, but I, I do acknowledge that we need to, maybe we need to expand our definition of what successful uh, restoration means within the context of residential waterfront landscapes. And I think we need to help waterfront homeowners try to become more comfortable with the messy, but we also as restoration practitioners may need to make some of our restoration projects just a little bit neater in order to gain that wider acceptance. Uh, it's important to understand the homeowner discomfort with uncertainty and change and the need for signs of caring in the landscape for cues that suggest order and that kind of reflect, their, their, reflect themselves within that context. So here's that, that main message again, you know, I just, I'm gonna hammer it home, but to be successful with stewardship and restoration at the residential waterfront scale, we really need to factor in these human considerations as well. And, um, you know, we can try to balance that messiness with a bit of, of comforting order, you know, have some areas that involve lots of natural change, but maybe some areas that are gonna be a little bit more familiar and certain, you know, hard, some hard lines, um, but also mostly organic and wiggly ones. Um, try to integrate this awareness of opposing priorities so that we can, we can help homeowners change behavior and, and embrace the messiness of the shoreline. So here's one more example um, that I wanna show before the restoration or before the armor was removed. And here it is again afterwards. And you know this is a particular project that I think tries to juggle those two priorities. Um, the, it, the project, re respects the connection to the sound. It, it, it maintains a view corridor through the, through the middle of the project site, but it also does integrate some of that vegetation that will be allowed to grow larger um, and become mature over time. And so I think here people are trying to find that balance. Minutes, As part Karen. of- Thank you. Yeah. As part of the Shore Friendly Technical Assistance Program, um, we also visit a lot of properties that remain unarmored um, to help those landowners with questions and concerns. And I think these sites provide really nice tangible examples where homeowners are successfully maintaining their connections to Puget Sound without armor and without clear cutting their shorelines. Um, you know, this family works with an arborist and they maintain views through their, their Douglas fir along the shoreline. 
This particular home is set far enough back from the shoreline that the family can weather any storms or erosion that might come their way. Um, I really point to these examples when I visit sites where bulkheads are beginning to fail. I share these real examples so that waterfront homeowners can imagine themselves with different futures than what is in front of them right now. It's critical um, that as restoration practitioners, we continue our work to create more and more examples so that those examples become the norm and not the exception, right? We wanna create examples that um, help our waterfront community imagine themselves on those sites, even as we're also removing those bulkheads, removing the fill, recovering beaches, shrinking lawns, planting trees, freeing those shoreline processes to resume and habitat to rebound. So after six years of work with the waterfront community, it's really clear to me that homeowners and practitioners have a lot of similar underlying goals. We all care really deeply about the health of Puget Sound, and we really want future generations to have the joy of seeing abundant salmon or an orca pod passing by. Um, the calls keep coming and people are curious to understand coastal processes. They really wanna understand more about how they can support the sound and they're trying out our recommendation. Uh, so there's a lot of hope here. As far as I'm concerned, messy is still beautiful. Um, there's beauty in the messiness of environmental stewardship when it's embraced by people with very different perspectives um, and beauty in our varied approaches to research and restoration, um, which is pushing us forward. So uh, it's all part of the same messy equation and I'm grateful to be able to be part of that. Um, so I wanna say thank you. And um, in this particular slide, I just wanted to acknowledge the many, many partners who are involved with Shore Friendly. It's, it's a big effort, it's happening Puget Sound wide and um, we're all learning a lot. So thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, so uh, David Trimbach, you are next. And so Karen, if you uh, wouldn't mind, um, we, maybe I think we have time for one question during the transition, but okay. if you want to stop sharing your screen while we, while you answer it, if that's okay, so that, so that sure. David can uh, get started. Um, awesome. Yeah. So uh, I don't see any questions right now for Karen. Um, I think okay. it's just a reminder that uh, we're kind of tight with our timing um, in between the speakers. So if you could type your questions before the end of the talk, that would be helpful. Um, oh, we have one from Simone. Um, it says, I love this presentation of the issues, Karen. I'm wondering how much of this issue is a matter of cultural preferences versus how much is functional or cost mitigation necessities for landowner? And how do we find that balance? Mm. <laughs> That's a great question. And I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a good answer for that. Um, you know, probably both, uh, both elements are part of the, part of the solution there. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be something I, I look forward to discussing in more detail with, with all of the practitioners and researchers in the, um, in the follow-up. I think that's, but that's the right question to be asking. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so great. Um, our next speaker is Dr. David J. Trimbach and Andrea McLennan, you are on deck after this. And the title of David's talk is Exploring Sense of Place and Shorelines in Puget Sound. Great, thank you, Tish, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm actually gonna be actually building on a little bit of what Karen just talked about. I wasn't expecting that, but, but here we are. So I'm gonna be actually talking about one of, the, one of those human conditions um, that she was mentioning. And so uh, today my talk focuses on a, a part of a much larger multi-part uh, social science project um, that is exploring sense of place and shorelines in the Puget Sound uh, region. Let's see. Oh, so, and before I, before I jump into this presentation, I thought I would pose some questions to all of those 214 participants uh, who are here today at the summit. Um, and I'm really interested in what your specific shoreline connections or attachments or bonds are. Um, and so I have some questions here that I'd like you to think about um, as, I, as I talk about my project. So what initially motivated you or motivates you to do nearshore work? What is the near, why, or why is the nearshore environment important to you? And maybe more importantly, given that many of you work, directly work with communities, why is the nearshore environment important to your community partners, including perhaps shoreline property owners? 
And so we're just gonna pause for a moment just so you can kind of soak in these questions and, and think about them a little bit more. Um, and I'm sure that uh, partly what comes to mind for you, and you may not actually use this language or these terms, uh, are, are, are what could be defined as a sense of place. Um, and sense of place is an interdisciplinary social science and multidimensional construct that is explored um, in many different fields, including environmental psychology and human geography, which is actually where I come from as a social scientist. And sense of place tends to be uh, broadly defined as um, meanings, attachments, and identities that we associate with place, including the natural environment. Um, and this includes various uh, dimensions, including place attachment, um, which refers to those connections, bonds, um, and attachments that people have with particular places. Um, uh, different, also uh, different identities or forms of identification that we ascribe or attribute to specific places. Think about your hometown or the country that you're that you live in or you're from. Um, these, the, these might be uh, associated with place identity. Um, also, place dependence. So those different dependencies that people have with specific places to achieve specific goals or um, um, to meet uh, specific needs, including things like perhaps food, sustenance. Um, and also there's place meaning, which refers to those diverse range of meanings that we ascribe to different places. And you, and you likely have more than one meaning that you ascribe to a singular place. Um, and sense of place research since the 1970s um, to today has really changed from a humanistic and philosophical construct to something that is more applied um, and something that is more quantitative and used directly within uh, environmental planning and management. And that is the kind of sense of place um, that I'm talking about today. Although I do recognize that it has a very rich history um, and it's, it's growing uh, in its use and application because it is seen as impacting if not predicting um, behaviors, attitudes and responses or reactions to place change. And while place attachment has an enormous body of growing work, place meanings specifically tend to be underexamined and undervalued. However, a lot of social scientists who explore a sense of place are understanding and recognizing that underlying people's attachments to place uh, are place meanings. And so place meaning allows us to better understand the why of sense of place and why people feel connected or bonded to a particular location or engage in specific behaviors. And there's been a considerable amount of work done on sense of place in Puget Sound. Um, it's been examined as an attribute of indigenous community health. It's been linked to shellfish harvesting practices. Uh, it's been uh, considered a, a component of recovery conflict. So you have differing senses of place which are represented within um, recovery conflict. It's also considered a dimension of human well-being as represented on the Puget Sound Partnerships Vital Sign Wheel. So um, we actually, my lab uh, actually monitors sense of place in the Puget Sound region every two years through a region-wide survey. Um, we actually analyze data from the 2018 survey. And so we know that residents in our region have a high or strong sense of place to the, to the region's natural environment. Why shorelines, you, you ask? Well, the shorelines are integral to our region uh, and social ecological system. And this is represented through a, a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different examples as to why, including the shoreline armoring vital sign, which is also monitored uh, through uh, partnership uh, partners. Um, there's regional strategies focused on shoreline armoring reduction. We have the Peace Up Near Shore Working Group, of course. Um, but also there's a growing body of research within the social sciences and humanities that actually focuses on shorelines in coastal areas. Um, and I think this is kind of like the prime time for this kind of work. And I'm really happy to kind of uh, see, I, I, I'm happy to like contribute to this work through my own research. Um, and, and one of those terms or one of one uh, branch of that work focuses on the uniqueness of shorelines as what some call liminal landscapes. And la liminal landscapes are defined as those landscapes that are really hard to define because they're at the limits fringes and entail some sort of in-betweenness or constant change associated with them. Um, they're also often associated with senses of escape, freedom, transformation, and human creativity. Um, so these are considered unique both uh, in, in, in kind of landscape senses, uh, physical senses, but also in human senses. There's also concurrently a growing body of research focused on place change, um, specifically how place change through the, the installation and or modification or removal of environmental infrastructure 
impacts sense of place um, and impacts how people relate um, to place. And so the work that I focus on seeks to, to build upon this growing work on shorelines in addition to this growing work on place change. And there actually has been some work done focused on sense of place and seawalls, for example. So I conducted a 12 county survey in Puget Sound. Um, this was in 2019. And this survey sought to examine the sense of place of shorelines in a region among residents. And this included residents from all 12 counties of Puget Sound and was representative when it came to uh, age group, um, sex and uh, county of residence as partly illustrated on, uh, on this chart that you see here. And I asked a series of agreement statements uh, focused on different aspects of place attachment, including identity, um, belonging and attachment, which I consider uh, identical here. They're just two different ways of asking about place attachment, at least within this particular survey instrument. Uh, I asked questions uh, related to dependence, and then I included seeing and interacting with the shoreline and asked uh, whether or not uh, individuals in the region saw it as important to see and interact with the shoreline um, weekly. And so I asked a series of agreement statements, including I feel very attached to Puget Sound's shoreline I, uh, and uh, Puget Sound shoreline provides me with a sense of belonging and Puget Sound shoreline is uh, important to my identity, um, et cetera. And what I found was that when it came to belonging and attachment, Puget Sound residents over 50% um, stated they, they completely agree and or agree that um, the Puget Sound shoreline is important to belonging and or attachment. So we do see actually a strong, um, what can be defined as a strong uh, place attachment, again, a dimension of sense of place um, among residents to the region shoreline. I also asked, which is often not done, um, I asked an open-ended question related to place meaning. So I asked respondents to respond to a prompt, um, basically, um, what does Puget Sound shoreline mean to you? Uh, and then I actually used a common um, uh, framework or lens to analyze those results. Um, and this comes from more kind of like environmental social science work. And I came up with some specific categories ref which reflect various place meaning themes um, that came out of the responses. And so these included, um, and, and going through these, I, I saw some, some patterns. So uh, the most common place meaning theme or pattern I saw was feeling. Um, so these refer to feelings, emotions, or sentiments mentioned by the respondent. A very common one was that shorelines give people a sense of calm um, when, they, when, they, when they visit shorelines. Uh, another uh, commonly, a commonly found uh, place meaning was inherent meaning. So those tangible, intrinsic, seemingly in, innate aspects of the shoreline that are, that are objectively observable, like uh, shorelines being connected to nature or having natural characteristics. Um, that was another common uh, pattern or theme. Another was uh, connection. Um, so this actually connects directly to place attachment. So um, people responded in ways that refer to attachment, senses of belonging, and or some sort of connection or relationship between the respondent and the shoreline. So for example, an individual responded with shorelines provide them with a sense of home. Two minutes, and then, David. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then lastly, connecting to um, the idea of shorelines as liminal landscapes or these unique kind of places, uh, a, a small percentage, but a, a percentage of respondents actually reflected this sense of shorelines uniqueness at, at being thresholds, fringes, or being this place of escape or freedom. And an individual actually responded with shorelines provide them with an overall sense of freedom. And I also conducted some uh, inferential statistics um, and I found that length of residence was associated with sense of place responses, including stronger attachment identity and belonging. I found that shoreline property owners, uh, property ownership was also associated with responses. Uh, specifically, shoreline property owners actually had a lower or weaker um, identity and sense of belonging to shorelines and a stronger sense of dependence on shorelines. And then place of residence or county of residence was also associated with seeing shorelines. So it's people who resided in, in counties with more shorelines or longer shorelines actually had, um, uh, were more likely to say that seeing the shoreline weekly was, was more important. Um, so some key takeaways 
uh, residents have a sense of place of the region shoreline, specifically strong attachment. Um, length of residence plays a role in shoreline sense of place. And residents ascribe a lot of different meanings to our, sh our shorelines, including tangible and intangible, and they're often linked together, um, and feeling inherent in connection were most common. So some, some broader implications, specifically perhaps for practitioners, I think that sense of place could be integrated uh, into coastal planning and decision-making, and this could be done through focus groups or surveys, or even through applied frameworks like the Identify, Visualize, and Create framework that was proposed by Kibler uh, a few years ago. Um, place meaning specifically can help perhaps promote potential projects, outreach, or planning initiatives. Um, this could help gauge uh, conflict or potential responses to place change. Uh, and I think it also helps us understand that shorelines are unique and we should recognize that uniqueness. Uh, and, 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 and so doing that, we can uh, recognize that important the shorelines are important symbolic um, uh, areas that are ever-changing, conjoined cultural and natural landscapes. So thank you so much. Awesome, David, thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Um, so I think we have one time, one uh, maybe uh, time for one question uh, oh, sure. as Andrea, if you wanna start sharing your screen and Lisa Coughlin, you are on deck uh, after Andrea. Um, so go ahead, Jenna. Okay, um, Jill asks, aren't liminal landscapes also places where biodiversity is maximized? That is a really good question. And uh, within geography, like geography literature, I haven't seen that direct connection, um, but that is something that I would be really interested in exploring more. Um, so liminal landscapes have been explored when it, when it comes to shorelines, but also mountain landscapes or mountainscapes. And so I think that's a really good point that requires more fleshing out. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker is Andrea McLennan. And um, we just, uh, there you go, perfect, okay. Um, and the title uh, from Herrera Environmental Consultants and the title of Andrea's talk is Beach Restoration and Protection, Where Do We Go From Here? And uh, take it away, Andrea. Well, um, thanks so much for <laughs> just trying to figure out how to uh, advance my slides with all these windows open. Oh, there we go. Okay, well, uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I just wanted to start <laughs> by um, thanking ESRP for funding um, the two ESRP learning projects that I'm gonna be discussing here. So as, um, as other folks have covered today, you know, our Puget Sound shorelines or these beach systems are incredibly diverse. Um, there's huge changes along in the shoreline along relatively short distances, just walking along the shoreline, you can be um, in a completely different environment. So we're still in the process of really documenting this variability as we work just towards um, restoring and protecting habitats for, for salmon and orca. And um, I think that some of our data limitations are further amplified by changing conditions associated with climate change. So next I'm gonna just briefly talk about some of the main drivers of this diversity in shoreline. So, so starting with fetch, um, this is the overwater distance across which waves develop and form. Uh, differing wave environments results in, you know, different changes that you see on the, the beach or the bluffs. So um, more rapid erosion rates uh, and more rapid sediment transport rates occur along uh, shores with greater fetch. Uh, we have a huge diversity of shoreline types or geomorphic shore forms. Across the region, we have both eroding, uh, a range of different eroding bluffs from kind of more stable banks to rapidly eroding bluffs, and feeder bluffs. Um, there are depositional shores um, in various states of deposition. Some, some are continuing to prograde and accrete while others are more in a state of erosion. And then there's beaches that occur within net shore drift cells as well as uh, other beaches like pocket beaches that, that function as, uh, more as a closed system. The upland geology has a huge influence on the rates of change that are occurring on bluffs, as well as the sediment composition um, coming from uh, those bluffs that, that determines the sediment composition of the downdrift beaches. Tidal range is another um, 
highly, it, that, excuse me, has is a, another ma uh, major influence on shoreline conditions. And there's a uh, large variability in tidal range across the north-south gradient of Puget Sound with narrow, narrower tidal ranges in the north that increase as you move south. And the tidal range essentially determines that vertical band across the near shore in which the most sediment transport occurs. And we have fluvial, sin, flu, fluvial inputs to varying degrees, ranging from small streams to large river systems, like here in uh, the Nooksack Delta. They're all contributing a range of sediment supply as well as organic material to the near shore. And many of our shorelines are in a, um, you know, a contrasting condition from their historic condition due to anthropogenic alterations, both from shoreline armor and deforestation, um, as well as, you know, residential development all, on, along our shorelines. Now, the response of our beaches to sea level rise depends on many of these variables that I just mentioned, as well as the local rates of sea level rise and the ability of the shoreline to naturally adapt to these changing conditions. Our shorelines um, will naturally adjust to a rise in sea level by shifting upward and landward, the process referred to as shoreline translation. But this process requires both um, sufficient sediment supply and space to shift landward, both of which are constrained by shoreline armor and shoreline residential development. So as a result of all of this variability and data limitations, uh, we proposed and developed two different ESRP learning projects. Um, Long-term bluff recession rates in Puget Sound is um, the first that I'm gonna kind of briefly review and then the beach strategies project. And I'd like to add that um, all of this work was done while I was um, a member of Coastal Geologic Services and included a, a great team of individuals. There was was completed with the help of a great team of individuals. So the data from these ESRP learning projects can better inform restoration and protection of beach systems in the context of climate change. And I'm gonna show you how. So by better understanding um, the background bluff erosion rates, we have a starting place for better understanding safe setback distances, informing restoration feasibility, and predicting future bluff erosion rates as bluff recession is expected to accelerate in association with the rise in sea level rise. So it's really those two processes are occurring in tandem, the acceleration in the bluff recession rate and the acceleration in sea level rise that is expected to occur. And there's a lot of uncertainties um, about all of these different drivers, but this is the data that we have now um, to, to start with. And you can see um, the dots on the maps here are all of the places where we have a long-term background bluff erosion rate. This data is specific to, um, to bluffs and long-term erosion rates. Prior to our study, there were only 20 to 30 long-term bluff erosion rates um, that had been documented in the region, um, which we were able to increase that to over 180 different sites with much more um, very, you know, with much more um, spatial distribution. Um, so um, previously those, those 20 or 30 sites were largely located within the, um, I guess the, the Port Townsend quadrangle. So really in, in the Northwest States. So we started the project by, by measuring um, the long-term bluff recession rates throughout the region using two different methods. Uh, aerial photography in, G uh, in GIS using a, a well-loved extension called DSAS or DSAS that was produced by USGS. And um, we compiled, um, oh, excuse me, and then this, the second method that we used was um, field measures using historic survey monuments, the NGS monuments. Um, so those are very accurate and repeatable measurements that, um, you know, that from, uh, that spanned across a wide range of, of time. So um, then for each of those measurement locations, we compiled considerable supporting data um, on those bluffs. 
And then we performed a multi uh, variable analysis, multivariate analysis to document the strongest relationships um, with bluff recession. And, the, and then we developed a, a predictive model with those outputs. Uh, what we found, oh, excuse me. So we, we documented that range and then we documented the most uh, dominant drivers as um, fetch, shore type, surface geology, and tidal range. And um, we can actually use that predictive model to estimate bluff recession rates in the absence of local bluff recession rates, which, which you know, has um, a lot of different uses for both, you know, informing armor removal feasibility and identifying infrastructure that may be threatened in the future, kind of make, make decisions based on, you know, cost benefit. How long is that coastal road going to be um, there for? So should we consider realigning or relocating? So. Now I'm going to move on to the Beach Strategies project, which was a four-year project. Um, it had two major phases, and that work was um, done in collaboration with Paul Schlinger. The first, in the first phase, we compiled and updated several different important nearshore data sets, including shoreline armor, where we added additional information on what year the data was collected and if it was collected remotely or in the field, and where there was additional data available, such as um, you know, the material of the shoreline armor, the tidal elevation of the tow, and so on and so forth. And um, then we compiled an updated geomorphic shore type. So for, for sound wide coverage and in areas where, the, where there was previously just, they were previously just mapped as modified. We looked at the historical shore type. So whether or not that was historically a source of sediment, like a feeder bluff. Uh, we measured the maximum fetch using an improved approach from what was available in the shore zone data, database, pardon me. Um, we updated the net shore drift cell mapping. And then we updated the shoreline parcel data to include each of these data at the parcel unit scale. Um, all of that included um, updated shore friendly social marketing outreach segments, which are associated with different targeted behaviors for restoration protection and increased stewardship that are used by the shore friendly program. So in phase two, we developed an evaluation framework um, using the phase one data. Um, and that whole process was guided by um, an end user outreach effort and a fantastic steering committee. Um, the evaluation framework is tailored to these four different priorities for doing work in the near shore that we refer minutes, to as Andrea. modules. Thank you, Tish. So we have the different modules are sediment supply, forage fish, spawning, and pocket beaches, since they obviously function differently as closed systems. And um, each module consists of uh, different query outputs and supporting data at multiple scales. So scales ranging from the drift cells down to shore forms and then smaller reaches of armored and unarmored bluff. And the queries were rooted in different landscape ecology and conservation biology principles that essentially provide insight into how broken near shore processes are at various scales across the landscape, largely due to the presence of shoreline armor. So these, these data can be paired with other local data to highlight high benefit restoration and protection targets, as well as identify areas with more and less resilience to sea level rise due to degraded sediment supply and abundant shoreline armor. So we, we learned an incredible amount about our shorelines as a result of these two projects. And I think there's many different ways that we can expand upon the data. Uh, more work needs to be done to complete uh, the barrier embayment module. Uh, essentially, we, we, we need better data on where our barrier embayments are um, to be able to make the connection with their sediment supply areas. Uh, we also need to consider the tidal elevation of shoreline armor mapping to further focus where critical forage fish spawning habitats are endangered due to sea level rise and the coastal squeeze. Um, we also would like to see more documentation of the relationship between marine riparian vegetation and bluff recession rates. We think there's great opportunity for um, continuing to monitor bluff recession rates 
um, where these NGS monuments are located that could produce really valuable, highly accurate um, measurements of long-term shoreline change. So we could really be able to kind of detect that signal of where bluff recession rates are accelerating um, as sea level rise accelerates. And um, last but not least, uh, we need more information on structure setback distances. Uh, we really need that information to be able to inform uh, restoration and protection feasibility, as well as improving our understanding of where structures need to be moved landward. Uh, to prevent threatened homes and or threatening homes and infrastructure, which we really need to be able to um, prevent more shoreline armor. Um, and you know, doing cost benefit analysis of where it makes more sense to to relocate things away from the shoreline with um, the anticipated acceleration in um, coastal erosion due to sea level rise. Um, so I think that ultimately sea level rise and climate change will result in additional restoration and protection opportunities. And by, by starting to consider where, where we're going to be moving um, structures away from this hazard, um, we can identify those opportunities and in some cases, you know, prevent hazards, um, more uh, hazards to, to flooding and coastal erosion hazards from flooding and coastal erosion. So thank you very much um, for, um, for listening. And um, thank you to the ESRP Learning Program for their generous funding, knowledge, and support, and to the many colleagues that contributed to these efforts. And um, thanks for bearing <laughs> with my, um, my uh, clumsy speaking today. <laughs> That was great, Andrea. Thank you so much. I love the picture of the kid flopped over the rock. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that was a great talk. And um, we, I think, have time for one question while we do the transition. I also just wanted to remind everyone um, about the chat. So if, uh, if you have a question for a speaker, um, please put it in the Q&A, uh, not the chat, if you are an attendee. If you're a panelist, weirdly, you actually can't use the Q&A, you have to use the chat and we will um, we'll manage that as best we can. So if you're a fellow panelist, go ahead and use the chat for a written question. Attendees, please use the Q&A and please uh, address uh, the speaker by name so we know um, which speaker it's addressed to. I know that some of the speakers have been um, able to um, answer them uh, with writing in a written answer, and that's great. If you can do that, uh, we, that would be fabulous. Um, if not, um, we are keeping track of these, of these questions and, um, maybe, and that can be something that contributes to the proceedings or we can otherwise kind of take that into the next um, phase of this uh, project. And, um, and there's also opportunity to approach the speakers um, during the Wonder Lounge. Um, okay, uh, so um, thank you so much. Uh, we've got uh, Lisa Kaufman already sharing her screen, fabulous. And uh, Steve Dundas, you are on deck. Lisa Kaufman is with the Northwest Straits Foundation and Lisa will be talking to us. Um, uh, the title of Lisa's talk is Using Existing Barriers to Identify Future Opportunities and Needs. So thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, so I, uh, I get to implement near shore restoration projects um, and lead the shore friendly program for the North Sound uh, in partnership with Island County, the Swinomish tribe and friends of the, of the San Juans. And as a rec restoration practitioner, um, you know, we get to implement the natural and social science that many of you are researching. So I hope that our observations uh, help inform that work as much as your work informs ours. Come on. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so many of the low-hanging fruit uh, opportunities where there's an intersection of feasible armor removal opportunities, um, along with willing landowners and fundable projects have been identified. But we're still far from achieving the levels of armor removal and prevention that will be necessary to ensure long-term habitat protection. Hugh and Karen both already touched on many of the challenges we face with implementing beach restoration. Even in this year of uncertainty, uh, the shore-friendly programs across the region have been introducing new content, enhanced incentives, and collaborative approaches, uh, including videos, virtual workshops, seminars, and even virtual site visits when we could not meet in person. However, with all of that work, uh, new approaches and tools are still needed in addition to what we're currently doing. 
We're constantly tweaking the model, working together to find new ways to encourage landowners to make this themselves, as well as the habitat that we're all here to protect. We've added assistance for landowners to improve what they have, riparian vegetation, drainage management, and not just armor removal. These are small steps that help landowners overcome the shock of the big picture issues, some of which Andrea definitely mentioned, um, but we need to address those big picture issues too. So there's still several barriers to change. We need to continue to address these barriers to armor removal as well as prevention of new armor and increase the focus on climate change and projected sea level rise within that context. Landowners are acutely aware of these issues. They're deeply connected to place. And as Karen kind of mentioned, it will be a, both a driver and an obstacle to encouraging that change. I'm primarily gonna talk about physical barriers, uh, but I'll touch on these others um, as well. Shore Friendly Program uh, was developed initially to address and reduce these social barriers, um, but we also need to explore uh, whether the perceived barriers have changed. The barrier or the behavior objectives preserve unarmored conditions or remove armor where not necessary have not changed. Uh, original surveys that were completed as a precursor to Shore Friendly Program also didn't really address climate change as a dominant driver of landowners' decision-making processes. So on the social side, we need updated social science data to determine if the incentives provided now are enough. We need to know whether the understanding of armor impacts has changed over time. And as landowners learn more about sea level rise and climate change and how it will affect erosion, will they change which behaviors they're willing to consider and implement? We've had potentially some missed opportunities. Um, because of our reluctance to talk about certain subjects with landowners over, over these years. Northwest Straits Foundation has been offering armor reduction site assessments to private landowners for almost a decade. We've completed well over 200 site visits to address armor impacts and encourage natural shorelines. But it's really only been a couple of years since it was deemed okay to address considerations for managed retreat, elevating or moving houses out of high-risk areas. Sea level rise has not really been addressed enough with landowners and we didn't do enough to remind people that bulkheads just don't stop water. This includes regulations that continue to allow short-term solutions to long-term problems. We need to start looking at restoration and protection potential as a graduated step-by-step -step process, and not just can we remove armor now. For both armor removal and prevention of new armor installation, we need to take a step back maybe and reapproach sites that we've previously deemed infeasible. Can we look at all of these different sites through a different lens of opportunity? Sure, friendly site assessments have shown that structure setback distances are the most frequent constraints to feasibly removing armor from shoreline parcels in the region. Structure relocation is not viewed by many shoreline property owners as an alternative to armor, despite it potentially being a more cost-effective long-term solution to erosion threats, particularly in the context of sea level rise. Previous surveys conducted as part of the shore social marketing strategy to reduce Puget Sound shoreline armoring, ask shoreline property owners about their likeliness to move a house further from the shoreline. Overall, at the time, only 1% responded that that was a likely option. 33% would be more likely to move a house if they experienced a major erosion or flood event. But that might be too late, and they often fall back to old solutions that are still permitted. So we need to incentivize getting homes, septics, and other infrastructure away from the shoreline. This then opens up the possibility of removing armor and especially completely avoiding its installation in the first place. These are not just habitat and coastal processes issues. Eventually, like other coastal communities around the country, it will become an economic issue. Insurance rates will rise, cleanups will occur at the cost of the public, and it will become a human health issue when structures and septics are inundated or fall into the sound, and rebuilding will still occur due to strong property rights policies around here. So this requires a long-term commitment to helping, as well as new incentives, and as Andrea mentioned too, some more spatial data to identify where some of those best opportunities exist. But in cases like this, where houses are teetering on the edge and could very well fall in pretty soon, timing is everything. Landowners cannot continue to put this off and sleep through it. Maintaining nearshore sediment supply is a critical element for nearshore e ecosystem resilience and will continue to lose current and potential forage for spawning habitat. We also know that bulkheads at the toe of a bluff do not prevent bluff erosion. 
Inadequate setbacks on bluffs need to be addressed in a timely manner before it becomes too late and contractors are not actually able to safely move a house away from the edge. So how can we help expedite this? Amy Kinney's work that she'll talk about tomorrow um, on the revolve, revolving loan program could be a great first step to help move this forward. But how do we talk about these issues? Uh, there's toolkits that were developed by the Georgetown Climate Center for discussing managed retreat, and it can certainly help. But we need Puget Sound specific language and talking points. Our tideland ownership is unlike any other coastal state, so the messaging here has to be different. Uh, this, this particular toolkit provides different and more palatable language that maybe will be um, better taken you know, by these landowners. But what is the best language to use here? Does that work? You know, does language that's used in other regions work here? Uh, I think we need to do some research to figure that out. Um, it may vary with each community. And even if discussions don't lead to immediate considerations, at least we're planting the seed with landowners for future discussions. Well, the primary barrier I focus on is reluctance to consider managed retreat. We need to continue to identify and implement policy and regulations that discourage armor. I think we're doing better at this. Um, the shoreline armor implementation strategy is a good start, but it's implemented in pieces and not comprehensively or equally across all jurisdictions. It's more, it's more difficult to install new bulkheads and certainly not as common as it was, um, but not always. Emergency permits, Variances for setbacks, et cetera, from county to county still make it easier to install and repair armor than it is to remove it or use natural solutions. The MART team is working on changes for federal permitting of armor removal, but local permitting is still daunting, costly, and unpredictable, even for those of us that do this for a living. There's still little consideration for the cumulative impacts of poor land use planning and armor installation. So how can we change that? Loss of sediment supply and loss of spawning habitat potential has a cost, not just on an individual parcel, but along entire drift cells. So how do we ensure that it's considered uh, in decision-making processes? Uh, obstacles also exist that make it hard to encourage managed retreat. So we need to work to change these. Required setbacks from roads and easements don't always allow enough room to move when parcels are small and narrow. Is that an opportunity maybe for change, working with some of our, our local um, uh, uh, and regulators. The prevalence of indi individual septics rather than community scale treatment or hookups to municipal sewers add additional challenges to moving a house. Armor re removal also often results in the ordinary high water mark moving landward, which reduces the distance of the septic and drain field from that mark. So that's a, a health hazard potentially as well. And the continued perception by landowners that removing lawns in exchange for a beach is a loss of property rather than just a change is another obstacle. But in some cases, this is actually true. If a landowner owns the mean higher high watermark and they don't own tidelands, moving that mean higher high watermark landward does effectively reduce their ownership. And they're not excited about that at all. So how do we get there? How do we get to where we wanna go? Where do we wanna go from here? So in summary, we need updated social science data. We need to redo the previous shore friendly surveys and add new questions about sea level rise, climate change, and managed retreat. We need to incentivize not just armor removal, but also managed retreat. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that we completely fund moving someone's house back. They need to take responsibility too uh, for those decisions they've made, but it won't happen without a strong nudge and some good uh, financial help. Two minutes. Okay. We need a pathway to restoration and protection, once structures are safe, then we can set the stage for protection. We can come in, get armor removed, make sure that they're not putting in new, new armor uh, and know that their houses and their properties are gonna be safe for the long term. Can we institute policies and regulations that put a cost on sediment supply and spotting habitat through cumulative impacts assessments? And we need a Puget Sound specific toolkit for how to address managed retreat. And most finally, um, to kind of bring all this together, is there a, a possibility of instituting a, a pilot project to move or elevate a community? A parcel by parcel approach isn't really gonna get us where we need to go. And as I said before, it requires a long-term commitment to helping. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Lisa. That was great, um, really love the talk. Um, so I think we have um, a moment for questions. Um, 
we've got one question. So David mm -hmm. asks, isn't the new core regulatory jurisdiction, um, doesn't it now occur up to the high tide line? Uh, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> not sure how, how you know, uniformly it's being uh, enforced. Okay. Yeah, that was it. Just the one. Okay, awesome. Um, just a reminder to um, put the questions that you have in the Q&A. Um, Steve Dundas, I see you sharing your screen. That's great. You're welcome to also have your video on if you want while you're talking. And, um, and if you're a panelist and want to ask a question, you can use the chat because um, you won't have the ability to use the, the Q&A and, &A and put, um, put the name of the person that you're addressing the question to. That would be great. Um, Okay, our next speaker is Stephen Dundas. Um, Tessa Francis, you are on deck. Um, Steve is with Oregon State University and uh, the title of Steve's talk is Economic and Policy Implications for Coastal Housing Markets Facing Sea Level Rise and Erosion. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you, Tish. Uh, my name is Steve Dundas. I'm an environmental economist with Oregon State University. So I'm gonna take you in an academic direction here. I do a lot of research on coastal ecosystem services, both the provision of the services and the value of those services to society. And I do a lot of work on restoration, both uh, salmon habitat and wetlands, but also a lot of my focus of my work is on uh, beach nourishment, beach restoration, armoring, and as retreat, all the different policies that we might think about needing uh, as we adapt to climate change. So I was asked to talk today about a little bit of this work. So we're gonna, uh, uh, as a caveat, I, I don't currently have any projects in the Puget Sound. Oh, I'd be more than willing to uh, listen to uh, a lot of the issues that are, are going on over the next few days and uh, make myself aware of, of, of the issues in the Puget Sound region. Uh, so right now we're gonna kind of fly south a little bit to Oregon, uh, two projects about shoreline armoring. I'll tell you a little bit about, and then uh, actually fly to the East Coast for a couple uh, instance that I'd like to share just about manage a current managed retreat policy and kind of a cautionary tale about uh, changing land use policies uh, to, to uh, deal with sea level rise. So as an economist, I just wanted to start with by saying, well, why, why does economic analysis matter when we're talking about management of our beaches and shorelines? And a lot of speakers have already pointed today that shorelines uh, people gravitate to shorelines. They want to live near the shorelines due to the natural amenities. And there's always this, this trade-off between the risks and the amenities that are provided by those housing choices. Uh, and given sea level rise and climate change, we're in an area where we need to better respond how the people are going to respond to different policy changes, different risk shocks, and different information that's going to change the environmental quality in their area. And as an economist, one of my main goals is trying to understand what the Incentives are created by current coastal policy are uh, to understand how people have behaved and why the existing shorelines look the way they do to better understand how they might change in the future. Uh, and though and another part of my research is, you know, changes in policy or realization of, of risks can either create or destroy economic value. And uh, that, that's typically when, you know, policymakers and people uh, gravitate to these issues is when having an economic impact. So I'm gonna take you down to Oregon, talk about state planning goal 18. So coastal armoring in Oregon is, is highly regulated. Uh, and there's actually been a ban on armoring since 1977 uh, with Oregon's uh, coastal land use policies. However, due to concerns about uh, takings clause under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, any property that existed prior to 1977 was grandfathered in and allowed to continue to armor. Uh, and it, didn't, uh, that exception did not uh, die with when owners changed hands. So there are still plenty of parcels on the Oregon coast uh, that have the right to armor. So there's a very, there's a clear property right delineation where about half of the oceanfront parcels can armor and another half that cannot. Uh, and that armoring, uh, you know, on the outer coast is, is more about protection because of the wave climate in the Pacific Ocean. And so it provides a private protection option for homeowners but there's a lot of public environmental concerns that come along with that armoring, especially if it limits beach, beach access. In Oregon, we have the beach bill, which provides a permanent recreation easement to our coastline. So the public have access to every mile of coastline. Uh, and armoring uh, to protect private property tends to take away, uh, you know, footage, square footage of beaches that the public should have access to. 
and then other environmental concerns up on the screen here, altering the natural landscape, breaking kind of the ecological connections between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems and the sediment cycles. So this is a picture last weekend uh, in Lincoln City, Oregon, where uh, the media had portrayed it as a seawall collapse, but actually it was pilings that the property owner had put in on their private property, which were not regulated. And this property actually does not have the right to install shoreline armoring. So a huge section of the beach collapsed. And uh, this is the type of uh, activity that's occurring on the coast and, and places that are eroding highly and likely to see a lot of uh, lawsuits uh, cropping up soon about the state uh, planning goal 18. Because currently under state law, this, this, these property owners have no right to install any protective structure. And it's on them to figure out how to uh, deal with this. And this particular living room is, is hanging off of, of the cliff here. Because of the way the eligibility for armoring uh, came to be through the state's land use planning goals, uh, it's created a sawtooth pattern is, is what state planning agencies call it and who's eligible and who's not. So on your screen here, you have a aerial view of Arch Cape, Oregon, where parcels highlighted in green have this right to armor and the red parcels that do not have the right to armor. So we have these haves and have nots. So the research question in a, in a recent paper that I published is how, how do these private housing markets, housing markets uh, capitalize the private option to invest in coastal protection? So we look at oceanfront parcel sales in the entire state of Oregon for 11 years. Um, we collect a ton of data on the parcels themselves and also the risk factors. We had a geomorphologist at Oregon State, Peter Ruggiero, help us with erosion rates and, and measuring uh, distances from structure to shoreline to capture the, the elements of the housing market that people uh, care about when they make these, these big decisions. And, and key uh, kind of identifying feature here of this analysis is that we're trying to make a comparison of similar homes. So the example here, A and B, they'd be similar in every way, except one has this option or this property right to armor and the others do not. So we're trying to isolate all the other things that might affect housing markets and key in on this armoring eligibility option. Interestingly enough, we found that existing structures did not capitalize on housing values. People, you talk to enough homeowners and they don't want to armor because of all the negative effects related to aesthetics and the naturalness of the beach. However, they do wanna be able to protect their private property. So the, the interesting thing we found, it was the option to, to uh, for coastal protection that capitalized into housing values but it didn't capitalize in housing values for the average oceanfront home. Um, you know, but when we did segregate the sample into eroding beaches or low elevation parcels, we, we started to pick up some pretty significant effects. And so for, for homes that were at low elevation and on eroding beaches, there was a huge premium relative to homes that were on low elevation eroding beaches that did not have the option of up to 22%. So this is implying that some, sometimes the value of oceanfront homes in Oregon that have this eligibility were up to $135,000 higher than ones that did not, suggesting the market was cognizant of these risks. We also tested for spillovers. So with that sawtooth pattern, if, if you were next to someone that had the option, your property value was actually diminished because you're potentially concerned about deflected wave action if someone puts up a hardened structure on your shoreline. And what this is allowing us to do is, is calculate how this particular land use policy has capitalized into all Oregon's oceanfront homes, both eligible and ineligible. And those values are currently being used in kind of a scenario-based plan for coastal futures to understand how climate change and changing this policy might impact Oregon's coastline in the future. With that finding of those kind of spillover effects, uh, a former grad student and I went after looking at what drives the landowner decisions? And so we had 25 years of, of data of all eligible parcels in Oregon of when they choose when they chose to armor. And we gathered a great database of both the risks that they face, but also the spatial interactions between their neighbors that might drive them to decide to change their shoreline and install shoreline armoring. And we use this model to look at what the future of the coastal landscape might look like under alterations to goal 18 and under sea level rise projections. 
So the key thing here is that we, we were kind of going after these pure effects, that it's not just your erosion rate, it's not just El Nino events uh, that will drive someone to armor. They might actually be concerned if their neighbor armors, they say, hey, I might want to avoid that spillover effect, or there might be kind of learning effects from seeing it going on in their neighborhood. What you're seeing here on the screen are the results of lots of simulations, all those small dots are an individual simulation, but those lines are suggestive of the fact that if we start at the bottom here, that's our, our baseline model. Um, and then adding uh, with just geomorphological risk factors, when we add influences of direct neighbors, you see the armoring counts rising up to that middle line. And then when you add in the fact that people are likely to learn the decisions of their neighbors, we see armoring accelerate. And, and those bumps up you see at 17 and 34 years are just uh, simulations of El Nino events that would drive serious erosion events. So the key factor here is that we, we learned that people do learn from their neighbors. Uh, and it's and a, potentially a more important component of shoreline armoring decisions than the um, than risk factors themselves. Two minutes. Great, thank you, Tish. Uh, we also looked at, with our full peer model, we looked at removing the armoring restriction and that's labeled policy variability there. Huge jump in armoring if we remove the prohibition on armoring uh, in Oregon. And then if we add sea level rise into our, our projections of, of the risk changes, it does go up a little bit, but the climate variability is small here. So the takeaway that we learned is that policy really matters here. Is what do the property rights scheme looks like and, and how might you uh, alter policies in terms of shoreline armoring are going to have a much larger effect on what the shoreline looks like in the future uh, relative to climate change, at least in Oregon. I'm just going to briefly mention two other recent or ongoing work. Uh, one is in New Jersey on managed retreat. We look at a Blue Acres program where they're actively compensating landowners to voluntarily buy out from flood prone areas. Uh, this is federal money funneled through the state and then municipalities are given the option to coordinate with land landowners to purchase properties. And so our kind of empirical analysis of this program is currently, is currently still ongoing, but it's three key takeaways that are important for thinking about managed retreat. Uh, what we found is that participation in towns with uh, high property tax assessments are not participating in the program, indicating a, we call a principal agent problem, that instead of trying to make their communities more resilient, they're more worried about losing their tax base. We all see that, that policy interactions are huge, that if there's any FEMA money coming into these municipalities for any other reason, it tends to lower participation in programs. And municipalities are, tend to be reactive rather than proactive, and they're not accounting for sea level rise. Lastly, I'll just mention a uh, recently published work from North Carolina where uh, the state coastal commission said, hey, we need to take into account of sea level rise and we need to change our coastal land use uh, regulations. Uh, and before anything was implemented, um, we, we found housing starts increased by over 27% in that window before something was implemented. So policy announcements can also move housing markets in ways that you would not want them to move. I just want to thank NOAA and Oregon Sea Grant for supporting some of this research. And thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, um, okay, I think we've got time for some questions. Yep, we've got one. Um, you might have touched on it right at the end there. Simone asks, how accessible is the option to armor information to prospective home buyers? Is it listed on Zillow, for example, or is the onus on the prospective buyer to inquire about armoring options and legality? That's a great question. There is, as far as I know right now, there is no real estate disclosures that, that require it to, but the, the state's Department of Land Use Conservation and Development does have a website with a freely accessible database that shows who's eligible and who's not. Um, a lot of the problems now exist because of the lack of this information in the 80s and 90s when people purchased properties that had, you know, 300 feet of beach in front of it. And now they, as the picture showed, some are about to fall in and they don't understand why their neighbors can do it and they can't. So it's, it's not, it's great that there's an armoring prohibition, in my opinion, in Oregon, but there's also a lot of issues that you know, a 40 year old land use law is, is currently still creating. Thank you. 
that was it. Okay, thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm feeling really excited by the blend of speakers that we have uh, in this session and just um, feeling like we're, we're already meeting our summit goals by, uh, by getting everyone together. <laughs> so it's really fun to, uh, after months of planning, to sort of see this uh, coming together. Um, so our next speaker is Tessa Francis. Um, and after that, we will have our lunch break. Um, and I'll give you some information about the Wonder Lounge, which um, is a an informal way for all of us to interact uh, while we're having lunch. Uh, Tessa, um, uh, are you there? I'm here. Awesome. Okay, great. Uh, Tessa is with uh, the Puget Sound Institute, and the title of Tessa's talk is Effectiveness for Shoreline Restoration for Nearshore Fishes. Hey there, everybody. I'm Tessa. Thank you, Tish. Thank you uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Uh, thanks to you all for hanging in there to the last talk in the session. This is it's definitely the, the biggest crowd I've ever given a science talk to, so that's pretty cool. Um, and special thanks to uh, Genoa Soloway, among all my collaborators, who um, is responsible for uh, producing most of the slides I'm going to share with you today. So I'm going to start by um, sharing an image that we poached from a recent paper by Emma Hodgson, which is a review of stressors and estuaries uh, on salmonids, great paper. Um, but just to remind us that urban estuaries can be particularly stressful places for fishes to live. And, um, you know, I'm among other people in this talk and I focus today on one particular stressor, which is shoreline armoring. And thanks to the work of uh, a lot of people who are presenting at this summit um, this uh, in the next few days, but also to many of you who are listening in, um, we, as well as work honestly on lakes and rivers and other marine systems around the world, we're really starting to appreciate the benefits and the positive effects of the removal of shoreline armoring for nearshore habitats. Uh, and species, and, and some of them are listed here and include increased terrestrial marine connectivity and invertebrate diversity and um, grad more gradual beach slope, finer sediment composition, and increased habitat for beach spawning forage fish. And you know, most of this work looking at the effects of armor removal has been focused on beaches and intertidal habitats for very good reason, because they're the most adjacent habitats to the armor itself. Um, and you would expect that that's where we would see the strongest uh, negative effects and therefore the strongest benefits of armor removal. Um, but one gap in our understanding is um, what effects shore shoreline armor removal has on near shore fishes and their use of adjacent subtidal habitats, just these slightly deeper waters um, offshore. In, in other words, you know, how do the how far offshore do the benefits of shoreline armor removal extend? And so that's the focus of our work. And to answer that question, um, we focused on four species: uh, two salmonids and two forage fish. And I'm just going to foreshadow our results by reminding us that each of these four species, chinook, chum herring and smelt is dependent on, while each of them is dependent on um, near shore, on shorelines for at least one life stage, um, they each have somewhat different relationships with shorelines. And so here what I'm showing you are data from our study showing uh, monthly patterns of um, abundance observations as well as the lengths of the fishes that we observed. And so I like to think of salmon as basically being on a road trip. Uh, they're passing through the littoral zones, hiding from predators and growing on their way to deeper waters. And you can see those pulses um, of that migration in our data here. And these are the size of the fishes that we collected. And, you know, this size of Chinook, um, you know, somewhat more robust at this stage. They aren't really dependent on super shallow, low turbidity, calm waters that you might expect of Chinook who are sort of in this lower size range. 
Um, and then this size of chum are known from previous work to be keyed in on epibenthic invertebrate prey that are most commonly found in eelgrass beds. So these two species of forage fish, herring and surf smelt, in addition to using shorelines in similar ways to Chinook and Chum for refuge and forage, they also, in their adult life stages, use shorelines to spawn. Herring spawn on submerged vegetation and smelt on beaches. And so they may be keying into different features of shorelines, or they may be keying into shorelines in just wholly different ways. Okay, so what did we do? So we surveyed six sites uh, in Puget Sound ranging from Glen down to South Puget Sound and um, half of our sites, three of our sites had eelgrass. Those are the ones marked with the little green boxes and then uh, half of them did not have eelgrass. And at each site, each site had a stretch of shoreline that was armored a stretch of shoreline that was natural and unarmored and a stretch of shoreline that had uh, that was restored where the armor had been removed. And each of these three shoreline sections were uh, within the same drift cell and often very close to each other. We, uh, oh, and I should say that the restoration projects that we um, surveyed were between three and seven years old. And so at each uh, site, we surveyed um, fish monthly um, between April and September for two years. Um, we did that by dragging a Lampara net, which is basically a modified persane deployed from a boat at three different depths, at one meter and three meter depth at mean low, low water, and then a further offshore site um, 50 meters off from that three meter site. And we identified and counted and measured uh, everything that we caught. And to analyze the data, we fit Bayesian generalized linear models using fish abundance as our response variable and combinations, different combinations of survey site, um, shoreline type, so that's armored, natural, or restored, uh, and presence of eelgrass as predictor variables. We used a weight of evidence approach to based on Bayesian stacked weights to choose our top model for each species. Um, and those are the results that I'll be uh, presenting here. So I'm just gonna orient you to the plots that I'm gonna be showing you. Each one has the log of uh, fish abundance on the x-axis and then the response variable, the predictor variable on the y. And these half eyes that I'm showing you, these distributions are the uh, posterior distributions estimated by the model and they're clipped to the 89% credible intervals. So 89% of the probability density would um, be occurring within this range and then we've marked um, the median estimates as well. Okay, so first the best model uh, for Chinook abundance included just a single predictor variable of survey site. And, you know, this makes sense on first principles. This effect could be is likely the um, result of the distance between um, spawning river or a natal delta and our survey site. So you can see that the site with the highest abundance is Cornet Bay, um, which is right around the corner from Skagit and Snohomish rivers. Um, and the rest of, you know, that had Cornet Bay, we saw the highest abundance of salmonids as compared to the rest of the sites. So shoreline structure was not featured um, in the top model for Chinook, which had over 50% of the uh, total weight of evidence. The best model for Chum was also, also just contained a single predictor um, for eelgrass. We found 12 times more Chum at sites with eelgrass than sites without. Um, this matches my foreshadowing conveniently where I've reminded us that um, previous findings have observed that chum of this size are commonly found in eelgrass and likely owing to uh, foraging on epibenthic prey that are uh, found in eelgrass beds. So again, no uh, effect of shoreline structure in uh, the top model for chum. So the story gets a little bit more complicated for forage fish. Um, first, I'm showing you the best model for herring, which included um, predictors for survey site and shoreline type and eelgrass. 
So a couple things to point out here, first of all, which is that the maximum abundance that we observed of herring is about double that of the maximum abundance we observed for either of the salmonids. There are a couple of sites where we never found herring, so Seahurst and Edgewater sites. Um, we never observed any herring. Um, you can see the effect of site here. So each of these like uh, triplets of half eyes represent one site. Um, and then the black is the restored site and the green is the natural and the blue is the armored. And you can see a couple of sites, family tides up at Orcas Island and Cornet Bay um, have higher abundances of herring um, than the other sites. And that makes sense because they're very close to uh, herring spawning sites in those areas. Um, we found overall that the, the, within a site, the most um, herring were found at natural stretches of shoreline and uh, the least amount of herring were found at restored stretches of shoreline with armored, site, armored stretches being in the middle. Um, the model included eelgrass, but the effect was very weak. So um, we see a shoreline effect um, as a as a predictor of herring abundance. They appear to prefer natural shorelines um, and the restored uh, shorelines are sort of the least preferred. Uh, the story for smelt gets even further complicated. <laughs> the model, the best model for smelt was the, um, included all the same predictors as for herring, but with one additional um, predict, uh, one additional term for the effect of um, sort of the interaction between site and shoreline, which tells us that the effect of shoreline structure on smelt varies by site. Um, so a couple of things to show here. First of all, the maximum abundance of smelt is now super high. It's like seven times the maximum abundance that we observed of salmon. Um, again, like with herring, there were two sites, uh, Turn Island uh, on, um, San Juan Island and Seahurst Park, we never observed any smelt. And then a couple of sites, uh, Docton on Vashon Island, which is like a quarter mile from my house that way, and um, Edgewater, we only observed uh, smelt at one shoreline type. So at the armored site at Docton and the um, restored site at Edgewater. One minute, Tessa. The two sites where um, smelt were most abundant and observed at all three shoreline types. Um, again, the maximum abundance varies. So at Family Ties, we saw the most smelt at the armored site, while at Cornet Bay, we saw the most smelt at the natural site, with the other shoreline types being roughly the same. So for forage fish, unlike for salmon, um, shoreline structure was a predictor of abundance, but in neither case did we observe a positive effect of restoration. So just to summarize, um, we did not find a clear effect of uh, restoration in the form of armor removal on subtitle fish abundance, um, geographic location on eelgrass were the best predictors of salmon abundance, natural shorelines appeared to support the greatest abundances of herring, shorelines matter for smelt, but the effect really varies by sight. Um, so just looking forward, you know, obviously this work is really local in scale. We're trying to understand links between local scale restoration or local scale shoreline structure and local patterns of fish movement and abundance. But we know that fish are using habitats at a much uh, larger spatial scale. So we have continued funding for this work from Washington Sea Grant to not only just repeat the field work, but also to expand our work into a data analysis effort where we are going to aggregate um, lots of observations of near shore fishes and relate them to landscape um, scale predictors um, associated, including you know, shoreline armoring and other uh, features of land use and other features in the water to try to understand relationships between these landscape scale features and, and fish movement. And so if you have nearshore data and you're interested in contributing um, nearshore fish data and you're interested in contributing, um, hit me up. Um, and, and then we're also um, hoping to link that, um, that ultimate database that we produced to the Beach Strategies database to help inform um, restoration decisions. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you to our funders and all the folks who came with us out on the boat and you all for hanging in there with me. Thanks. 
Awesome. Tessa, thanks so much. Uh, that was really great. Um, let's see any, uh, any questions for Tessa to put in the Q and a. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything yet, but we can give it a minute. Oh, Paul um, asks, are you looking at correlation between presence, absence, restoration of armor and other features that fish might actually experience? How, how far offshore was sampling? Yeah, good question. So, you know, when we think about why we don't see a strong effect of restoration, there's a whole lot of hypotheses about why, but one, the most basic one is, well, there's a lot of things we, that fish are clearly keying in on that we did not measure. Temperature, salinity, prey availability, you know, fish are, are making uh, complicated choices or making choices based on a complicated set of input in terms of where they can be at any given time. So, um, so one answer is we, you know, we didn't look at any of those, but we, we hope to in this next round. Um, and then the sec part, what was part two of it? I forgot. Um, how far offshore was sampling? How far offshore? Yeah, so it varied by site depending on um, slope because our near our furthest inshore site was one meter depth at mean low low water, and then three meters depth at mean low low water, and then fifty meters of distance offshore from that three meter depth site. So depending on the site you're at, that could be that could be a different distance from shore. I see a lot of questions and I will try to answer them in the chat. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Tessa. That was uh, perfectly on time. And, uh, and, and yes, we do have some questions in the chat. If you can uh, um, address them using writing, that would be fabulous. Um, we've been having great response from our panelists, uh, both in the chat and in the Q&A. Panelists are unable to use the Q&A to ask questions of other panelists. So that's one way for panelists to ask each other questions. And then the Q&A um, is for uh, all for attendees to ask questions. So thanks to everyone for um, watching that and, um, and paying attention uh, to, the, to the questions. And we, we are collecting all of that information um, to inform the next phase of, of this effort, which is um, uh, proceedings. The program also contains bios for all of the speakers, so please uh, check them out. We have um, just a, an incredible group of speakers uh, for this summit, and we are really, I feel, inspired and humbled by the expertise that our, that our summit has. So our, our kickoff speaker for the afternoon presentations is Colin Higgins with King County, and the title of Colin's talk is The Vashon Mori Experience to Implement or Prioritize. Um, take it away, Colin. I'll start making noises. Um, uh, at two minutes. Okay. Go, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about all the awesome work that King County has been doing. So showing some of the progress, uh, given the urbanized area gets a little bit of a hard time in restoration circles as to whether or not we can actually accomplish much. And I've wanted to toot our horn a little bit and sort of sort of show some sites like Docton Park West, where we pulled out a bunch of pilings, pulled back uh, 400 feet of armor, um, cleaned it up really nice uh, about seven years ago, or Docton Park East, pulled out another 200 feet of bulkhead last year. Um, or, so here's a nice after shot, or Big Beach a few years ago where we pulled out another 400 feet of bulkhead off this sort of low bluff. Or in the Lost Lake community um, where we made houses fly. I really wanted to sort of go into all of that, but as I prepared that somewhat self-serving slideshow, I went back to what ESRP was asking of the presenters. And I came away with two overarching things that I wanted to touch on. One, stop overanalyzing things to some extent and uh, just do it. Just go out and fix the things we already know need to be done. And then talk a little bit about what has actually worked for King County in getting some of that progress done. So for those of you not familiar with unincorporated King County, um, that's pretty much limited to Vashon and Maury Islands in central Puget Sound. The rest of it is part of the city jurisdiction. Uh, many people are aware that roughly 27% of Puget Sound is armored. Um, well, most of that's in King County. 83% um, of the mainland portion of the county is armored and 50% of Vashon Maury is also armored. So when you have armoring all over the place, what, what do you do? Um, well, um, we basically almost always go to prioritizing something. So why do we prioritize? Well, um, one, we wanna make sure we're not wasting our money or potentially your money. Um, we wanna make sure that we get the biggest bang for the buck 
or perhaps the fastest bang for the buck. Um, or we want to make sure this species and not that one is the target of the work. Um, or, and then we have some of these thorny ecological philosophical questions around, should we be restoring these heavily degraded areas or are they basically a lost cause? So all of these different things pop up in the prioritization processes. So what has been done so far in this basic area? So starting out in 2002 with people for repeated sound, uh, parts of uh, Vashon and Mori were prioritized. In 2004, the state came in and said, hey, this is an important place as far as the reserve area. In 2004, uh, the RIA paid uh, Coastal Geologic to go out and map shore forms throughout the county and then also prioritize uh, bluffs for restoration and protection, both regionally and by drift cell. 2005, the salmon recovery plan was adopted and it had its own stamp on marine shoreline priorities. 2005, King County worked with the Trust for Public Lands to create the green print for King County, which covered the entire county, but had a marine shoreline component as well, saying these are the best places. In 2006, uh, the RIA hired Anchor Environmental to go out and relook and prioritize the entire shoreline one more time because uh, there was some sort of like, maybe we've done too much on Vashon and not, not enough on the mainland, so where should we go? Uh, many people are familiar with the ESRP, or uh, PISNERP came in and said, here's where we think we should be restoring. 2011, Shore Friendly was released and it had sort of its view of how to look at the world. Um, and uh, recently, so like last year, King County working with regional partners is looking at launching its own program and did its own prioritization within this structure here. Uh, of course, last year, ESRP released Beach Strategies, which has a set of prioritization processes for how to look at the shoreline. Um, and then just uh, two weeks ago, the Salmon Recovery Plan was adopted, or the update uh, in Ryan 9, and has a new set of priorities for the marine shoreline. Uh, and then going backwards in time a little bit is the Vashon Green Print from 2008. Um, this is actually the one that the county generally uses and relies on. This particular approach combines a variety of upland and shoreline issues, as well as risk to development, rarity of certain habitats, uh, and not just sort of a single look at like a shoreline edge. So you think about all those different things, you, you, you might wanna ask, well, how do they look together? Is there an overlap? Well, to some degree, when you overlap them all, it's just a big mess. Uh, basically the entire shoreline is highlighted as a priority. Um, but there are some areas where there's a lot of overlap. So for instance, the KVI point higher drift cell on the east side of the island shows up in most of those prioritization processes as a place that should be protected and or restored. The south end of the island also shows up in the same way as far as both sides are show up as a high priority target in most of the different processes. So um, what have I learned from going through all those things and being involved in almost every one of those? Um, some prioritization is necessary and good, but I think we might be overdoing it a little bit as a region. Um, there is so much effort to justify our actions that we sometimes forget to ask, is it really worth doing in time and money to prioritize the same areas yet again? Are we really seeing a benefit for the level of investment? And then finally with that is how often are these exercises more a checkbox for a grant application versus really insightful and helping us figure out where we should be going. So switching gears a little bit towards the, okay, prioritization, what has been working well for King County? Um, well, um, long-term vision with a set of priorities. So while I did just slam prioritizations, I was really referring to doing it over and over and over and over again. Clearly we all need some kind of plan to work from. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, King County has relied heavily on uh, this document uh, to set the priorities for where we try to do actions on the island. And I wanna bring up a word that actually came up briefly in Hugh's talk at the beginning, which is opportunism or opportunistic. It seems to be a bad word frequently in the grant agencies as to, um, it's like you're not being strategic if you're being opportunistic. Um, but I think if you, structure opportunism within a plan of this nature, you can be strategically opportunistic. And so this has allowed us to really, um, we have these priority areas and we have priorities within these priority areas, of course. And so being opportunistic within that means if you have a tier three instead of a tier one site come along, take it, think about the long-term, don't worry about the near-term. 
it fits into your strategy. And I think we need to really change opportunism and opportunistic away from being a bad word to a good word. And I'll just point out that the county has been working heavily in these four areas for the last 10 years. These are part of our strategy and we take advantage of opportunities that pop up in those areas. Another thing that has worked well for the county throughout the county, not just on Vashon, is having what we call a watershed steward. And so we have six watershed stewards throughout the county. For Vashon Mori, uh, Greg Rayborn is the steward. They serve as the county's eyes and ears on the ground. They serve as the point of contact for community members that need to contact somebody at the county. He coordinates with the nonprofit partners, groups like the Flood Control District, and really importantly within the county. So many of you familiar with governments don't always know what the other arm of the government is doing. He really helps try to bring uh, sort of the slogan of one King County to reality versus having uh, different departments undoing each other's work. And they also work on implementing the salmon recovery plans. I would describe the basin stewards as sort of chess masters uh, for the county. They're sort of making sure which project is ripe and is moving forward. They're making sure there's lots of different projects in different phases moving forward. So we're not just putting all our effort behind one project for five years and then another project. There's lots of different pieces moving forward. Um, they do a lot of grant writing to acquire and protect natural lands, as well as do habitat restoration projects. And then of course they are uh, making sure that those projects are being implemented. One of the examples of a benefit to the steward of having a steward like this or a position like this is in the last 10 years, the Vashon steward has bought 50 properties and only 12 of them were listed on the open market. Now, for those of you who've tried to do acquisitions before, you, you probably know why this is important. 75% of the people came directly to the county saying, would you like to buy our property? That gives us the lead time to like a year, a year and a half out to pull together the funding to make it happen. When it goes on the market, it's really hard to respond because you don't have money sitting around like that. So this is the type of benefits of having a position like that, that is a community like leader and everyone knows who we are. So as I mentioned, we do a fair amount of acquisition for restoration. Now, uh, our restoration targets have been, uh, at least for the last 10 years, heavily focused on the edges of existing higher quality areas. And there's some really big advantages to sort of, uh, you don't have to build setback structures because you already own the land on the other side, so you don't have to protect anything. Um, and we've also take, had a lot of opportunities come around when there's been a generational change in ownership where younger relatives take over some of these older almost uh, beach shacks and trying to bring them up to code is not easy and they're frequently like you know what i'd rather you guys have it and restore it um, instead and so we've been able to build off of our larger natural areas to like this another piece that we uh do is acquisition for protection. And it's come up in some of the chat and some of the other places that our regs aren't always effective. Uh, we see examples of reason, reasonable use exceptions going in where sites that shouldn't be developed are, you see degradation still happening. Um, we have definitely seen a lack of enforcement that's not stopping private actions from degrading the environment. And we actually have the numbers on that. It's not just anecdotal. Um, there's definitely quite a bit of issues with enforcement in the sort of central Puget Sound portion. Um, Two minutes, and, Colin. Thank you. Um, and so like we've been acquiring different parts of the point higher drift cell here. This is just shot from the ground. It's two miles, roughly two miles long, really nice habitat. Um, and this just shows you the progress we've been able to make in just the last 10 years. I mean, I really want to highlight the county has a longstanding effort around buying natural lands or pulling together natural areas. And this is Part of like making sure you have a long-term goal and not letting perfect be the enemy of the good in the short term. And this is where having a plan but being strategically opportunistic within it is extremely important because you'll see some of the uh, parcels in the um, bottom of the slide are somewhat isolated, but we fully expect by 20, 30 years from now, most of that shoreline will be in county ownership. Um, and so none of this happens without money, of course. Um, and one of the things that has been a, a big key to the success is actually having local funding sources um, to match the PSAR, ESRP and surfboard money. So we have a conservation futures levy that's been around for more than 30 years that allows you to buy open space. Parks expansion levy went in another 10 years ago that allows you to match the conservation futures. So we're able to buy properties outright. 
We have a local salmon recovery grant program funded through the flood control district that allows for acquisition and restoration and frequently dwarfs surfboard funding uh, every other year. King County puts its own money into restoration projects and we have a new coastal hazards program launching uh, this year. So two thirds of what we spent for buying the uh, point higher properties has come from local funds. So to summarize, we need a plan, um, but you really need to be strategically opportunistic within it. Um, we need to be spending more time doing and fixing things than prioritizing. I strongly recommend trying to develop those local funding sources, as well as making sure you have dedicated staff to implement these actions. And as much as I've sort of mentioned that this is all King County, this is clearly a, a large group of uh, and individuals, sponsors, groups that have made this happen, not just King County. And with that, I'll end it. And if there's time for questions, great. Uh, you're muted, uh, Tish. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I guess it's, it's not a day if you don't do that once. Um, thank you so much. That was really great. Um, and we do have time for a couple questions. Um, so Lindsay will uh, look at the Q&A and read them to you. Yeah, we do have a question from Ian who asks, would you say that your selection of the four areas you identified as targets for King County emerged as a consequence of the many prioritization processes you outlined? Or were there other drivers regarding their selection? Um, there was, I would say mostly around the Vashon Greenprint document really highlighted com combining upland forest areas that were still intact with the shoreline areas that were still intact, as well as sort of risk to development of some of those areas. And that was one of the big drivers. And then it doesn't hurt that most of those sites are within the marine reserve. And that brings an extra sort of special attention with that level of prioritization. So it's a combination of factors, uh, quite honestly, um, but it has worked really well for us. Awesome, thanks so much. So I think we can move on to the next speaker now. Bianca, you're totally on track. You're sharing your screen and, uh, and I can't see you yet, but I'm sure I will shortly. And um, uh, Melissa Shutton, you are on deck. Uh, so you can be ready while Bianca is speaking. And um, Bianca Perla is from the Vashon Nature Center. And the title of Bianca's talk is Eroding Cliffs and Building Community. Thanks so much, Bianca, and take it away. Thanks. Well, this has been great. I'm really grateful to be part of this. I'm learning a lot. And Colin, that was a, a great synopsis of all the conservation projects on Vashon. And I'm going to go into some of those that Colin um, just talked about here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a long-term community science monitoring effort on Vashon, where we use volunteers to collect data on impacts of shoreline armoring removal. Oh, not. Uh, allowing me to advance. Sometimes if you put your cursor uh, sort of right on top, that helps and then click. Is that working? There we go. Um, so I'll, I'll be focusing on two main questions. One is presenting some data on the impact of um, shoreline armoring removal on three sites. And then I'm gonna get into kind of a qualitative and more philosophical qu question about ways in which community science monitoring can help uh, shoreline restoration efforts. Um, so I'm speaking from Vashon, which is down there in the right-hand corner, Vashon Mori Island. And um, most of our sites that we're, I'm gonna be talking about today are in Mori Island Aquatic Reserve. And you can see the other state aquatic reserves there for, um, for reference. And um, I'm gonna be talking about the three original study sites that we started to track in 2016. And we have three years pre-removal data. And now we have two years post-removal monitor, post monitoring, and we'll have a third year this summer, making it three years of before and after, after this summer. We're also in the process of studying three more sites there um, that we'll get results um, on fairly soon. Uh, so Vashon, as Colin said, holds large intact stretches of shoreline in King County. And so King County has begun prioritizing those shorelines for purchase from willing landowners and eventual restoration. And Vashon Nature Center was pulled in to create a citizen science monitoring effort for these acquired restoration projects with the double goal of gathering information about how the restoration projects um, were working 
and also getting, getting information out to the community, raising public awareness about shoreline ecology and the effect of bulkheads. So this is just a, the study design that we have for our sites. We have a bulkheaded control site, natural reference site, and then a restoration site that we monitored pre and post restoration. When we were looking at um, getting into this monitoring effort, we were connected with Jason Toff's team at the UW and decided to use the shoreline monitoring toolbox protocols, which have been a really good decision. And I'll go into that um, in, in a little bit. We looked um, at these different protocols and picked ones that we knew were appropriate for the sites and also we would be able to do with, with community volunteers. Besides these different protocols, we also used, uh, we also did forage fish surveys on these sites. So we used the WDFW protocols for those. Um, before bulkheads were taken out, we uh, quantified the differences between our natural study sites and our pre-restoration and, and bulkheaded sites. And in general, we found, it's been interesting for me to hear, because um, some of these sites are being studied by others as well. Um, we got uh, natural sites had significantly more overhanging vegetation and higher canopy cover. This is something that George Kaminsky also talked about in his talk this morning. So that was kind of cool to see that we're getting similar results. Um, the natural sites also had more woody debris and wider log line widths than our bulkheaded sites and um, larger back, back beach areas, which is also what um, George was finding out. Um, the beach rack uh, had, it, it, overall, we had more old rack that was built up um, on the, the natural sites, but there were also interactions with site and also the year that we collected data. Um, so the beach rack, uh, varied with, with other, other variables besides the treatments that we have here. Um, here's a picture of pre and post at Lost Lake. Um, and Colin just showed this um, area too. Um, an interesting thing to notice here is that we were, get, we're getting similar results. We haven't um, analyzed all of our pre and post data yet, but you can see when the bulkhead is pulled over on the right hand side, you can already see the log line forming there that wasn't there before. And that was within weeks of restoration. So that was pretty neat. Another thing to notice is the barren area. Um, restoration is an initial impact to these areas in terms of vegetation. And so you can see a lot of our, um, a lot of our sites are in a, it's a rural area. So they are highly vegetated even when they're bulkheaded. Um, and so, so restoration can, can impact that in the short time, but keep your, keep your eye on that area as I um, do a close up from a year later. And that's what you get. So the recovery is pretty, pretty rapid. And, um, and this, it's important to know that nothing was planted here. There was no revegetation effort that went on. This is all um, naturalization from an updrift um, reference site and including the, including the dune grass. So the recovery of the vegetation is um, at least at the um, shrub and ground level is pretty dramatic as well as the, um, as the logs. So a lot of our sites are pretty distinctive because they're high bank and active. And that's one of the interesting benefits of actually purchasing these properties um, is you can go full bore, right? You can take everything out and let nature go for it. And, um, and so you can see here the, the before and after differences and, and really the active sliding that happens in a lot of these areas, which leads to more um, sediment on the beach, more um, back beach habitat, and more logs right away. Um, other factors that we measured were um, higher trophic levels. We looked at arthropod fallout um, and it trended towards more abundance. We've only looked at the difference between natural sites and um, bulkheaded sites pre-restoration. We haven't analyzed the data for pre and post yet, but that will happen soon. Um, it trended toward more abundance on natural sites, but in some cases was confounded by site and year. We did a few fish snorkels, pretty low sample size for that, but it showed higher fish uh, abundance on natural sites. And interestingly, I was, when I was listening to Tessa, um, we're getting similar results for forage fish spawning as she's getting for the behavior in the, in the um, lower end or the um, deeper. And especially for surf smelt, we're not noticing a big difference. They don't seem to care whether, they seem to be more site specific than um, whether it's shoreline is the shoreline is armored or not, um, and so that's interesting. Uh, sand lamps seem to have to respond more to um, whether it's uh, armored or not, though. 
So in um, for this part of the talk, how do shorelines respond to bulkhead removal? Some things um, are very clear. Some things respond differently in terms of site and some changes take longer than others. And I think the overall message here is that really to truly understand the many ways that shorelines respond across time and across the region, it's an immense effort and it's a lot of long-term monitoring across many different sites. And that's where people power comes in. And um, people power has a couple different levels I, uh, here for our project. One is just the involvement of people on the ground, the boots and, um, and, and volunteer hours that are needed. These are some stats from our um, volunteer efforts by year and also across the whole um, five years. And um, so volunteers really can help us um, collect and gather, gather this data. Some common challenges of community science projects though are the QA, QC of the data, places to store the data, the capacity to analyze and do outreach about the data. And so that's where that next level of um, networking and people power come in. And um, for us, having that local connection is really important to get those boots on the ground, just like the basin steward is, is, is um, important for the prioritization of shoreline restoration and protection projects that Colin was talking about. But then there's that other level that gives us capacity, which was the shoreline database and the shoreline toolbox where we're connecting with other groups around the region. We're connecting with a higher institution of learning that can handle these bigger data sets um, and help with analysis. And so that allows us to work on these um, individual local projects, involve people, but also have data that can actually be used. And I think that's a really critical link that's really neat about this project and successful so far. Um, besides the boots on the ground, um, hands-on experiences that volunteers get um, can create environmental ambassadors in the community. And this is one of the people that volunteered for a day doing beach, uh, beach surveys with us and then was inspired to write an editorial to the local paper. And she says, I believed bulkheads were bad for the environment, but did not understand why seeing is believing. And um, to write an editorial like this in an island community where a lot of people are living on the shoreline and have bulkheads is, is quite impactful. And this is not something that came from the Nature Center or the county. It's from a, a community member. So that's a real big benefit potentially of getting people out and in involved in the process. So community science really is this bridge, um, bridge tool between that restoration and then the public education and involvement pieces of um, our management measures. And I think that, you know, um, Clancy has um, management measures in here for Clancy at all for protecting and restoring the Puget Sound nearshore and public education and involvement is called out, which is great. Um, I think that we need to start thinking about public ed education and involvement more, less as an output, less as something that comes at the end of the process where the experts has figured everything out and then they tell us what to do in the public and more as um, how can we get that public ed education and involvement in that adaptive management cycle so that people are learning alongside of us and, and, and are realizing that all of us are in this learning process. And community science is one way, uh, this really seems effective to do that. Um, and so I, one of our biggest challenges in conservation and restoration of Puget Sound is, is that public and political momentum that we need to create for, for moving things forward and moving that project life cycle forward. And one minute, Bianca, one okay. minute. Great, thanks. Community science um, does that in, in, and I think we could be more strategic about looking at this um, you know, right now we enter people into the process at that red arrow where they help us monitor and then we've seen they organically share what's learned with the community. If we're networked with larger groups that can help us with that data um, management, then our information also is shared on the scientific level. And then that creates both adaptation of people's behaviors as they, sh as they hear from their neighbors what's happening. And also if our information is used, it allows uh, practitioners to adapt their restoration practices as well. So I guess my final words in this are maybe that we, we're doing a good job right now um, looking at the pre and post, um, you know, doing comparisons pre and post restoration on our beaches. And I think this is a, maybe a call for social scientists 
maybe we need to um, integrate them better to, to look at these pre and post um, what happens with our volunteers pre and post um, volunteering, uh, because I think that would be a really good amount of information to have um, so that we can more strategically design these community science programs on the ground. So that's all I have to say. And here are our thanks to all of our partners. Awesome. Bianca, thank you so much. That was really great. Um, I think we have time for some questions. Yeah, we have one question from George, and he asks, for the natural revegetation, were most species, species native, or were there any issues with non-natives or invasive species? That's a good question. And um, we've been taking species lists at our sites, um, and uh, most of the time, the natural sites, about 80% of the species are, are native, and at the um, at the pre-restoration and the um, and and the control bulkheading sites, they're about 50-50. And so I think the answer to the question is, and and we'll be able to look at this after we analyze our post pre-post data more. But um, I think it's going to be depend on what's next to it. You know what comes back. And right for that Lost Lake site we were looking at, right next to it, updrift is a, a natural site. Um, so lots of that, um, the majority was, uh, was native that, that came in, but I think it depends on what's around the site for that colonization. Awesome. Looks like we've got one more in the chat. Yeah. Uh, did you notice a relationship with shell content at the beach? Oh, that's interesting. Um, no, I mean, we didn't look for that. So maybe we can start. <laughs> um, yeah, because it, it wouldn't even be called out in our beach rack, but we do have, we actually do have photographs that we take of each of the sediment bands um, in our beach profiles. So we could potentially go back and look at that. That would be interesting. Um, I, I'm wondering what the, what the interest is there. Um, What's the mechanism? Yeah, if there's any context, um, maybe the, the person who asked that question could add it um, to the chat or the Q&A, but yeah. uh, we need to switch gears now uh, to the next talk. Um, so uh, Bianca, if you wouldn't mind um, stopping to share your screen, thank you so much. That was really great. And um, Mel Shutton is next and Megan Detier, you are on deck. Hi there. Sharing my PowerPoint with you. Okay, perfect. Okay, are you seeing the full screen or are you seeing the screen with the notes? We're seeing the thing with the notes. If you can go to the little, um, yeah, exactly. That should do it. Okay, perfect. All right, great, All right. thank you. So uh, we're happy to have Mel Shutton from Washington Sea Grant. The title of Mel's talk is Beyond Broader Participation and Impact prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Salish Sea. Thanks so much, Mel, and take it away. Lito Chakma, thank you so much for attending the talk today on uh, Beyond Broader Participation and Impact, where I'll talk about prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Salish Sea. Thanks to David Trembach and the Symposium Planning Committee for inviting me to share on this topic. Uh, if you can and you're comfortable, I invite you all to uh, share the video so that we can help to uh, get the sense of building a stronger community in this virtual world. Thank you. I see you all popping up. My name is Melissa Watkinson Shutton. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation of, and also descend from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. I grew up here in Washington State where I have a family who are enrolled with the Upper Skagit tribe uh, growing up in Pacific Northwest, I've also become more familial and familiar with the Coast Salish culture, uh, where I get to, you know, enjoy the oceans and seafoods uh, more than I have gotten to enjoy my own cultural heritage of, you know, big rivers and crawfish. I'm joining you today from Farmington, Washington, which are the home traditional homelands of the Suquamish tribe. I currently work as the Equity Access and Community Engagement Lead 
with Washington Sea Grant, which is an, an organization that's housed at uh, the College of Environment and the University of Washington. And we focus on making sure that uh, communities and marine life thrive. Two of the ways that we prioritize uh, our work in getting to accomplish this is uh, through cultivating strong partnerships and bringing in diverse perspectives. Excuse me. So if you're able to, can you uh, use the rename function in Zoom? Hopefully this will have a chance for us to meet you all a little bit. Uh, if you can uh, change it to uh, include your name, your pronouns, your employer or institution, and your current location. For example, uh, my mind says Melissa, she, her, Washington, Sea Grant, and Bremerton. And if this is not a function, oh, I see that it's working for some people. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Hi, David. Okay, so my aim for today is to show how prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion can lead to more innovative restoration, restoration solutions that benefit all communities. One way we can think about diversity is by increasing the diversity of our workforce. Diversity here can mean the demographic representation and appreciation of individual, social, economic, and cultural differences. Diversity in the workplace can apply to your own individual institution and organization, or it can apply to the broader uh, industry uh, or scientific study that you identify with. For example, at Washington Sea Grant, we work, are working now to um, bring more diversity within our staff, as well as uh, the diversity of people who make up the marine policy and science uh, fields overall. This is a photo of my colleagues and I when we uh, got to share with each other the completion of our 10 year uh, DEI roadmap, which we completed last fall and have some work to do to make sure we're continuing to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion at Sea Grant. And by the way, I may be using an acronym at some point or another. It's DEI, that's just a shorthand for diversity, equity, and inclusion. You may also hear some folks talk about JEDI, which is similar. It's a, an acronym for uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So why does bringing more diversity into our work matter? Dr. Dorsita Taylor and her team, when she was working at University of Michigan, did a study about environmental organizations broadly on the diversity of staff within those organizations. They've identified that there's a green ceiling, which is the term that they've created for this, uh, which is the gap of environmental organizations having 16% uh, of people of color at most within our organizations. And so another way to interpret this is uh, on average, environmental organizations have fewer than 16% of their staff as people of color. And you, you know, across the United States, that percentage of people of color is over 40%. In Washington state, it's still even over 30%. Uh, and even our organizations are um, limited uh, to this 16% green ceiling. This is an even greater gap that's found within uh, leadership positions within environmental organizations. We can also think about equity in terms of how it's related to conservation. And equity can mean a state quality or ideal of being fair and just. Uh, in conservation, equitable, equ in equitable conservation can mean that individuals and communities who are being most impacted by say the restoration projects or the things that are causing you to do restoration projects are at the table participating and actively even sometimes leading in those decisions making about how it and where and uh, other um, ways that that restoration project is being implemented. 
So this might require you to shift a little bit of your time and resources in order to help to prioritize these efforts. Um, here's some more questions that you could be asking yourself. You know, who's sitting at the table? Who has access to these restoration opportunities? How can restoration initiatives be improved by expanding the table and giving adequate space for others to voice their concerns and interests? Washington Sea Grant has acknowledged that uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is, no long, is not just a, a, a thing that is in addition to our work, but it is a core function of how we are able to achieve our mission and vision at Washington Sea Grant. And then inclusive leadership is an essential twofold uh, practice in order to lead successful uh, restoration initiatives and other efforts. Inclusion is a state quality or ideal of being a part of a group or structure where the inherent worth and dignity of all people are recognized and respected. So who has access to a lead in these spaces? What kind of science and knowledge is, is predominant within your spaces? Is traditional and local knowledge uh, adequately represented and respected in these spaces and in your work overall? Uh, I'll share a brief story and example. A few years ago, I was able to, uh, I was honored to participate in the City of Seattle's Environmental Justice Committee for a few years. The committee is made up of uh, leaders who come from different communities of color across the greater Seattle area. Um, it was our job and our role within this committee to uh, be advisors to different city programs where we had four components that we were aiming for um, that included healthy environments for all, jobs, local economies and youth pathways, equity and city environmental programs and environmental narrative and community leadership. So we were working together across the, our, different, our different communities um, and cultivating this for the city overall. One of the outcomes of this work that I'm particularly proud of is the, this document that we created collectively um, on the principles of public space for communities of color. And you can find this on the city of Seattle's environmental justice website. Uh, it kind of goes into detail, just some pillars that are uh, essential um, based at least on the communities of color that were involved in the Seattle area. This may not be applicable everywhere, but um, it's good to potentially inquire about that where you might doing your efforts, be doing your efforts. Uh, but this you know, encompassed uh, considerations of you know, who, has, who has access to make those decisions, who's actually physically accessing different spaces. Do they feel like it's a place where they not only uh, you know, can attend or, and be physically present, but where they actually belong? where they can, where it ref reflects the community values that their particular community may, may have and being in public spaces. Uh, a number of different things to think through when it comes to how um, we're creating spaces for different people. And so given uh, the restoration aspect of this, of, of all of our work, um, I think it's critical to make sure that uh, we can think about different um, principles for engaging with different folks. Two minutes, Mel. Thank you. So there's, you're probably asking if, if, you're, if you haven't already at least, uh, where do I begin? And that question, you're gonna hear different answers from anybody that you ask, um, but I can give you a few starting points um, from my own perspective. Uh, you can really start off by building identifying and building a supportive network or community. That can be within your own workplace, that can be with, uh, with you know, potentially making a community of practice with people, not, maybe not within your institution, but other institutions that uh, are in your same field. And it could be outside of work in general, um, someplace where you feel like you can uh, have uh, critical uh, and safe conversations and learning. Also, of uh, sharing knowledge and resources um, within that space and potentially even across uh, your peers and colleagues. 
ask a lot of questions. It's okay. Um, you know, we're asking a lot of questions in our work. That's kind of what we all really like to do. Um, this is also a place where you can ask questions, but I would make sure to uh, do that respectfully. You know, don't ask, um, don't put all of that work on uh, a few individual people to answer that for you. Make sure that you're doing your own work to um, try to answer those questions as well before um, reaching out and asking um, uh, particular people. And then it's really been critical at Washington Sea Grant and I know in many places who have um, been pushing on the DEI front to get leadership on board in this space. So um, however you can engage leadership on DEI will be great. And then you know, following through with that would be to um, distribute capacity and resources and that's likely uh, gonna mean redistributing uh, your time and resources that you currently have. And that's all I have for now. Yako uh, Kei, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was uh, really great. We really appreciate you giving that talk. Thank you so much. Um, any, uh, any questions for Melissa, please put them in the Q&A or if you're a panelist, you can put them in the chat. You're getting yeah, some acc accolades. I'm not seeing any questions come in, but they might come in once the next presentation starts, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got some excellent presentation. Nice job, awesome work. So really great um, to hear this perspective and we're really excited to, to bring that into the summit. Um, great, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, well, we are right on time and we are excited to have uh, Dr. Megan Detier as our next speaker from Uni University of Washington and Friday Harbor Labs. And um, the title of Megan's talk is Learning What is Broken on Armored Shorelines and How to Fix Them. Great. Thanks, Tish. And thanks to all of the planning and steering committees for putting together this big, big effort. So, um, I'm not gonna talk about much data today. The data from uh, behind what I'm talking about is plentiful, but um, I will talk about what, we're, what we've learned and try and keep this talk more general. And this is of course, oops, no, I'm not advancing. Uh, advancing, no. Seems like what you're doing is good, having your cursor right over the slide and then clicking. Yes. There we go. Okay, um, great. okay. so um, I've been talking about work from a lot of other people, especially Hannah Faulkner and Jason Toft, who will be following me uh, in this talk. And this all started back with uh, Pisner, as you talked about this morning, where I was on the Nearshore Science team and really started learning about armoring. So um, if we're gonna fix what's broken on places like this beach, um, we really know, need to know what processes are broken, broken before we can really effectively try to restore. And uh, this is complicated because armoring can impact uh, so many different processes on a given beach. So uh, it can affect uh, encroachment by plunking uh, down onto the land, can affect land sea connectivity, sediment uh, impoundment, or hydrodynamics, such as alongshore currents or wave reflection. And uh, you've seen various versions of this model already, and it's not the last time you'll see them in this, in this uh, summit. Uh, but we know that restoration actions, such as armor removal, can affect a variety of different processes, which can in turn affect a variety of different structural changes. And then we can monitor those changes with uh, the things in the green box here, uh, many different metrics. And um, the, one of the confusing parts is that the same structural changes like backshore area and vegetation can result from uh, several different restored processes. So again, figuring out exactly what's broken can be hard. And especially hard because uh, as several people have mentioned already, sailor sea shorelines are messy, different uh, uh, wave energies, different aspects, different near shore bathymetry. So how can we attribute any armoring impacts to any particular altered process like 
hydrodynamics versus loss of sediment supply. And the way we dealt with this with our big armoring study was to uh, look, use a paired sampling design where each one of the points on the map here uh, consisted of one armored and one adjacent unarmored beach. And we looked at 65 pairs of sites uh, throughout the uh, Washington part of the Sailor Sea in our uh, big armoring study. And we used the same methods at all beaches. So a variety of uh, physical me methods and also biological methods. And each one of these methods generated uh, one or more metrics that we could use to compare members of the pair uh, or do broader comparisons such as among drift cells or regions. So just a real quick summary of uh, that, the big armoring study here. Uh, overall at those 65 sites, we found that armored areas had narrower, less shady beaches, as you've seen already from a number of talks. A trend towards beaches being steeper and with fewer fine sediments, as in this photograph here, especially in heavily armored drift cells. Less accumulated rack and fewer logs. Again, you've seen that in other talks. Fewer rack line invertebrates overall and fewer telidrid amphipods. Fewer insects in fallout traps. Uh, and then relatively little change at mean low water. So the further down shore you get away from the armoring, the less impact is, uh, is visible. So um, the problem is that these relationships between pairs of beaches cannot prove cause and effect. Um, so for that, we either need a time machine to go back to before the beaches were armored uh, or actual experiments like restoration projects. So I'm gonna talk uh, a little more here today about um, these two restoration projects, uh, the uh, learning projects in each case in two different areas using different management measures. So the Snohomish County, the management measure was a beach nourishment uh, project and down at Edgewater Beach, it was a feeder bluff restoration by actual removing of armoring. And in each case, sediment supply was likely at least one of the broken processes. And in each of those studies, uh, the data on all the parameters were gathered for several years before and several years after the restoration impacts or events. So uh, in the Stohomish study, um, uh, each one of the locations, each one of the dots here, as in our big armor study, had one armored and one nearby unarmored beach. So here the northern sites uh, up here in, uh, uh, near Everett uh, had these contrasting beaches and then sediments were added, I don't know if you can see it, to these areas that are orange on the diagram there. And at the southern sites, uh, no sediment was added, so down here, so those location service controls for just looking at changes through time that were unrelated to beach nourishment. Uh, so Hannah's gonna be talking about uh, some about the results from this beach nourishment, but in brief, the retention of sediment was brief, um, but uh, context really mattered uh, as Hannah will talk about. Um, so here, for instance, in these two sets of photographs, the beach in front of this uh, low shore armoring, and this is railroad grade in each case, uh, caught a lot of wave action, erosion occurred quickly, and so the sediment disappeared within months. You can see this site uh, within three months of sediment nourishment. It was gone again. Uh, now this was um, a deliberate uh, test of whether uh, dredged uh, spoils could be used, so it was a finer sediment that wouldn't otherwise uh, be necessarily used for nourishment projects. Okay, so if we look at the Clancy model here again, um, you can see that uh, the results on the right for Snohomish, uh, relatively small changes, uh, patchy changes. So FF is forage fish, sorry, that might not be obvious. Um, relatively small change in beach slope, uh, small changes in elevation, uh, and actually no change in things like uh, amphipod populations. And in fact, in some areas where uh, nourished sediment was dumped on the beach, it seemed to smother those high shore uh, uh, rack invertebrates. Okay, in contrast, uh, Edgewater Beach was a very different uh, study. So this is down in South Sound, down, way down here in South Sound. Uh, this is a, a drum, actually this is a shoreline photo of the whole area. And uh, in this case, uh, we studied three beaches. Uh, the restoration site in the middle is where armoring was removed. Uh, the site to the south here had armoring uh, that stayed there, a different property owner. And then reference site to the north that was a uh, unimpacted feeder bluff 
A little confusing in that we started out with uh, somewhat different beach uh, sediment types in the three areas, which made it a little harder to assign uh, changes through time. Um, so, but it was a great experimental setup for learning. Um, the armoring uh, to be removed here, you've actually seen pictures like this already. Uh, note the total absence of logs or rack in front of that armoring, uh, but you can see that it actually was holding back uh, not just a feeder bluff, but a pretty well-developed alder forest uh, behind that armoring. And then uh, in contrast, the, uh, the target, if you will, is a feeder bluff such as we found at this uh, unarmored site to the north. So um, that once that armoring was taken out, uh, that forest was no longer held back and we got to the big slump. So just for scale, these are human beings here uh, on the shore. This was a drone photograph. Um, so you can see a lot of sediment and trees came down onto the shore. All right, so very different uh, overall results uh, from this study. Uh, a lot more responses to that complete armor removal than we saw to the uh, beach nourishment project, uh, including the beach being much wider, uh, over a meter, uh, sometimes two meters wider, uh, where the armoring was removed. Uh, positive impacts on rack insects, or sorry, rack invertebrates. Um, positive response on trees, obviously. So much larger changes in that study. Okay, so just uh, again, really uh, just quick verbal summary of the lessons that we learned from these two learning projects. Um, nourishing beaches with sediment is seldom going to be more than a short term solution, as was shown at some of these Snohomish beaches. Again, not surprising, the process wasn't restored. Uh, we were just restoring essentially a structural element. Now, note that this will depend uh, in part on the sediment used. In this case, Snohomish County, as I mentioned, used dredge spoils. Um, it was a beneficial use of dredge spoils, but uh, short term. So uh, using coarser sediment from a different source likely would have resulted in longer term positive impacts. Uh, this is not something we set out to test, uh, but we definitely noticed uh, in the Snohomish study, uh, which is that small streams may be quite important in central Puget Sound for helping with lost sediment supply. So if what's broken is sediment supply, if you've got streams, even a culverted stream like this one here at Howard Park, all of this beach here is uh, sediment that came down from that stream and then moved north with a drift cell. Two minutes, Megan. To further north here, further north here where you see uh, basically none of that sediment anymore. So small streams, possibly important. Uh, thirdly, the absence of logs and rack on a beach may be a useful indicator that armoring is so low on the shore that it's probably having a negative impact on multiple beach processes. So in our uh, uh, big armoring study, we uh, uh, rather took a lot of time and effort to measure relative encroachment. But really, I think all you have to do is look at, look at the absence of uh, rack and logs on the beach and know that it's having a big impact, as opposed to places like this on the outer coast with no armoring where you can get rather outrageous amounts of log and, logs and rack. Okay, so learning what's broken on armored shorelines. Um, in the most egregious of armored shorelines, all these processes are probably broken. Uh, so to properly fix them, you need to take out the armoring altogether. But moving armoring back to a higher elevation can help with at least two of these, uh, the encroachment and the uh, altered hydrodynamic dynamic processes. Uh, or if there's a stream delta, again, that may help with the sediment impounding problem. And it turned out the Edgewater site was a lovely case where removing one wall allowed a restoration of a lot of processes in one fell swoop. Uh, so context matters, there's Tish on the beach, and uh, Hannah will talk more about this particular issue. Thanks. Awesome, Megan, thanks so much. You are perfectly on time, um, and we have some time for questions. Yes, so we do have a question, let me scroll up in my chat. From Jim, uh, you broadly stated the beach nourishment may not last long on the beach. There's a lot of evidence contrary to that form, uh, to that from other Puget Sound sites. Did you mean where the armor is into the intertidal and there's no sediment source left, perhaps? Yes, yes, Jim, naturally. Um, so, right, several things. 
well, context. Uh, so those wave exposed areas where the waves were reflecting right off low armoring and the sediment was fine sand, it's gone. But um, in some cases, that's probably the, or some ways that's probably the worst case scenario. All right, and then we have one more from David. Um, how many seasons was monitoring conducted at these beaches? Yeah, one. Uh, so we were very consistent. We always uh, went out in the uh, summer, the same month, often within the same uh, time of tide series. Uh, and um, there were other studies where looking at rack over multiple uh, seasons, but most of the work was done in just one. And I see something popped up from Kathleen, she probably being uh, uh, worrying about my dissing Snohomish County's work. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, I'm just saying under these circumstances, uh, it didn't last. Awesome, Megan, thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to, to keep with this uh, theme and um, welcome. It's also really fun to see pictures of uh, interacting with people outside doing science. <laughs> so that's fun. Uh, um, so yeah, thanks so much. And our next speaker is Hannah Faulkner. And Hannah, I, we, we are seeing your screen, awesome. So, um, okay, and I'm here. Your, and your audio is working, that's great. Okay. And so that's really good. Okay, and we'll jump right in then. Um, okay, so one of my favorite parts of the work I do is that I get to do it with a circus of brilliant individuals and organizations, and many of whom are here today and we've already heard from and will continue to hear from. Um, this collaborative approach to monitoring is an incredibly valuable component to the collection, interpretation, and influence of data. And that benefit is expounded here with all you individuals as we integrate our knowledge and experience. So thank you everyone for joining me today and hello. Um, I am Hannah and I work with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife out of Olympia to support staff, partners, and public in the assessment and monitoring of nearshore ecosystems and beach habitat. So today I'm going to be sharing recent interpretations, uh, like Megan mentioned, uh, restoration effectiveness from two Puget Sound beaches, which as the title describes and we've heard from many others can be complicated. So fortunately, there's immense participation in Puget Sound to support restoration. And I wanna thank the many partners that made this work possible. Um, I also wanna thank Tish and the Summit team for the welcoming land acknowledgement and reiterate that all this work resides on occupied Coast Salish territories. So monitoring is an integral component to the restoration project cycle and helps to reinforce effective management actions. Um, in the preceding talk, Megan summarized armor impacts to beach systems and introduced our monitoring work to evaluate ecosystem response to restoration. Now I'm going to elaborate some results of this work, but I suggest our uh, recent reports to ESRP for any additional detail. So the first project I'll highlight today, uh, again, is the Snohomish Beach Nourishment Project. Um, this project, as Macon said, was an extensive nourishment effort along the railroad and pounded shoreline between Everett and Muckleteo. Um, dredge material from the nearby Snohomish River was placed again at the four locations with the supplemental armor removal um, at Howarth Park. Now, monitoring started in summer of 2015 and the nourishment occurred in summer of 2016. Um, second, we have the Edgewater Armor Removal Project. Now, a lot of people today have talked about Edgewater. It's a great project. Um, this is located outside of Olympia, where approximately 800 feet of vertical cement and rock wall were removed from the toe of a historic theater bluff. Um, here, monitoring began in summer of 2014, and removal occurred in fall of 2016. <clears throat> So the intent of both these projects um, was to repair nearshore structure and function, but using different restoration techniques. Um, beach nourishment at Snohomish to augment a degraded system and armor removal at Edgewater to restore the degraded system. 
Now, we monitored, uh, like Megan mentioned, a suite of physical and biological metrics to assess the effect of restoration. But today, um, I'm focusing only on a few of those. Now, we hypothesized that restoration actions would result in an increase in upland toe elevation, an expansion of beach width, a decrease in beach slope, and a renewal of those finer beach sediments. Now, I am going to breeze over the methods here, um, but I want to highlight only that our sampling framework was distinguished in three key ways. Um, it included reference sites um, outside of the restoration footprint to compare change at sites without direct intervention. Uh, it included both armored and natural shorelines to compare differences associated with that upland structure. Um, and measures were taken both before and after restoration and for several years following to identify those restoration associated changes and change over time. So because of this, we collected a lot of data that can be presented in many ways. Um, now I'm going to spotlight uh, simply our before after data and highlight how results varied in context of site specific differences and over time. But make sure, of course, to stick around after for Jason's talk next, who will speak um, more to results from similar monitoring efforts. Okay, so looking first at the Snohomish project, <clears throat> it's important to acknowledge that our data showed substantial differences overall between armored and unarmored beaches, uh, regardless of nourishment effect we found that armored beaches were located lower in the intertidal, they were narrower in width, and uh, steeper in slope. Um, however, percent sand was not necessarily lesser at armored sites, as might be predicted, but instead varied spatially and temporally. Now, uh, the big one for changes associated with restoration, we found it difficult to broadly attribute nourishment effects due to variability in response by uh, presence of armor, by individual site, and over our study timeframe. And this resulted in changes that were slight overall. But looking at change uh, in beach width, for example, at each site, uh, A being our armored sites, U being unarmored or natural sites, uh, we found that while width increased on average, uh, it varied both within and among these site pairs. Now, for most armored sites, width increased following nourishment. Um, and particularly at Howarth, or 13A there, with the additional armor removal. But for the unarmored sites, uh, change decreased, uh, varying from negligible to um, relatively substantial. Now, changes in percent sand uh, similarly varied by site and over time. So sediment samples were collected near mean high water at two of the four site pairs within the nourishment region in most survey years. Prior to restoration in 2015, these sites were dominated by pebbles, um, characteristic of sediment-starved beaches. And following restoration, um, as predicted and intended, we saw an increase in percent sand at all measured sites. Now, although no pre-nourishment data was collected at 13A, um, enabling us to calculate that initial change, uh, this figure shows how nourishment here was uniquely and intentionally coarser than nourishment at the other sites. So, then in the years uh, post-nourishment only, we observed varying levels of decline um, back to those pre-nourishment conditions at most of our sites. Um, and it was only at site 9A that we saw the continued increase and um, sustaining of those finer sediments. Now, similar variability was seen in additional sediment tracking um, conducted by Frank Leonetti and Snohomish County. Um, that tracking detailed drift and persistence throughout the nourishment area. Um, we hypothesize, like Megan mentioned, that this uh, sediment retention was influenced by a variety of physical features, 
such as armor encroachment, um, shoreline shape, the proximity to those subtle embayments and small stream deltas. Um, more on Frank's work, again, can be found in our recent ESRP report, and I'm not going to expand on that here. So I'm going to transition now to Edgewater, um, where, again, an 800-foot length of armor was removed along the toe of the feeder bluff. Now, to some extent here, interpreting data from this project was also complicated by site-specific differences in beach structure. Um, generally, we found that the armored reference site was uh, narrower with coarser grain sediments. The restoration site was also relatively narrow and coarse grained, while the natural reference site was wider and sand dominated. Um, although not explicitly studied in our work, we presume these differences may relate um, to their position within the drift cell, um, armored uh, being the most updrift. Um, the feeder bluff that composes the back shore at the natural site, or to local wave dynamics independent of this. But regardless of these differences, um, we were able to quantify positive change in most measured parameters following restoration, and some unique to the removal site. <clears throat> As predicted, we saw a favorable increase in upland toe elevation, in beach width, and in percent sand. But contrary to predictions, uh, beach slope actually steepened following removal, um, although this change was slight. Now, with upland tow, um, we expected the elevation increase at our restoration site, um, illustrated in this figure by the orange line. As the removal of shoreline armor and placed high in the inner tidal exposed those new upper beach areas. Um, although this change is not dramatic, like you can see, um, it was sustained, um, and that was unique to the restoration site. Now, because this site included only armor removal, um, we were provided a unique time course of recovery when a site is reconnected with a feeder bluff uh, with no additional management action. Two minutes, Hannah. Thank you, Tish. Um, following the removal of armor, the upland fill and vegetated bank, uh, once held behind the structure, then slumped into the uppermost, uppermost beach um, and bringing with it, as you can see in this photo, an abundance of trees and new sediments and effectively continuing the bluff relatively low onto the shore. Um, we believe this uh, con contributed to the more gradual and sustained rate of change here. Um, compared to other armor removal sites where newly exposed areas are not left to voluntarily replenish or to such a degree. Now, unique to the Edgewater site due to its proximity to Olympia, we were able to conduct additional forage for sampling here only. Um, samples were collected monthly before and after armor removal and surf smell eggs were detected throughout across study sites and our survey time frame. Now, there's a lot going on in this figure, but I wanna highlight several key messages. Um, first, that eggs were found in greater numbers at our natural reference site, the gray line in this figure here. Um, second, that the highest counts of eggs occurred in winter months, um, as we expect in South Sound, but that we did detect eggs in summer months as well. Um, third, that this variability was multi-scaled and it differed by month and by season and by year. And it was extreme at times. Um, now in this figure, I actually truncated the Y axis so I could better illustrate the smaller scale differences throughout. Um, because it was in winter of 2016 that we detected on separate occasions over a thousand and over 6,000 smelt eggs. Um, our understanding of these spatiotemporal patterns determining the use of beach habitats for spawning remains insufficient. And due to the extreme variability in spawn abundance and timing, it was difficult to isolate and ascribe uh, restoration effect alone. Now, we know that management measures used for restoration are necessarily diverse, and practitioners must consider numerous spatial and temporal influences and outcomes. When we consider beach nourishment at Snohomish, we found it improved some key structural aspects to the shoreline, 
such as beach width and sediment composition. But these effects vary by site depending on local geomorphic features. And initial improvements may be unlikely to persist when limited in scope and scale. When we consider armor removal at Edgewater, we found that the change was not as pronounced. Uh, but the reconnection with natural sediment supply processes initiated the return of beach conditions to a more natural state. Um, however, a broader understanding of recovery timeframe and spatial scale remains incomplete. So we acknowledge uh, these limited determinations of restoration effect are not wholly conclusive of management actions. Um, however, they do provide some explanatory value as to the success of nourishment and armor removal and highlight some important considerations such as local site features and recovery timeline when considering future restoration work and again, the project cycle. That's it, thank you. Awesome, Hannah, thank you so much. Uh, that was really great. Hannah Faulkner from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, the uh, second of a um, trio of talks uh, <laughs> that were that to wrap up our afternoon session today. Um, we've got a couple, about a minute for questions. Um, if, if there are any that want anyone who wants to put them into the Q and A, if you're an attendee or the chat, if you're a panelist. Don't see any coming in. We had one from Ian, but Megan already answered that because you guys all work awesome. together. <laughs> Crack team, like it. That's great. Okay, Jason, I see you are sharing your screen. That's good. Um, uh, we are going to go ahead and start with Jason's talk. Thank you so much, Hannah. And our, our final speaker for the day is Jason Top Toft from the University of Washington. And the title of Jason's talk is Restoring Living to Our Armored Shorelines. Thanks, Tish, and thanks everyone speaking today. I feel like everyone's done such a great job and teed me up so much. I could just, you know, <clears throat> show pictures of my cats and my kids all day um, at this point, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about what this title says. And so I have living in quotes there just to recognize the different connotations of that word. You can have some people from different groups monitoring beaches. You can bring in that human dimension of people, even if they're not nerdy scientists, enjoying the beach. Um, those of us who are nerdy scientists, we like to monitor for living critters on the beach as well. And also I'm leading into one, uh, one piece of terminology here called living shorelines. And without going into this graph too much, just notice that there is a blob here in the middle called living shorelines that is in between true restoration and engineering. And so it's recognizing that at many of these beaches, we're not actually doing full restoration. Some of them we can or at least think we can, and some we're not, that they have elements of engineering. And so that could be as simple as anchoring some logs on a beach or building a bit of a berm to hold in sediment. There's a number of different features there. And so I like to think of that when we're out monitoring beaches, just to um, key into the importance of monitoring. Okay, so I'm the last talk of today. So I'm gonna start with a bunch of pictures. And this one is at Seahurst Park, which there's probably been about 50 photos of today, which is great. And armor impacts is what it's showing. It's showing the actual placement of armoring along a stretch of beach at Seahurst Park in the city of Burien. So uh, Megan mentioned that armored shores can be messy in interpreting data from them. And Karen mentioned this morning too that restoration can be messy. And is it beautiful? Well, when it's construction, maybe not so beautiful, but it has, um, it serves a purpose, right? It's a construction activity. And so this was when armor was being placed at that stretch of Seahurst Park originally. Now, this is a photo I also put in black and white. This is that same stretch of armor being removed in 2014. And there it's similar, right? These are construction sites. And I think it took a while for me to even recognize that because oftentimes when we're doing monitoring, we show up like the year after a site is completed. So that's when we start measuring effectiveness as opposed to more as built situation when it is a construction site. And so 
This to me though, is why it's so important to monitor these restored sites is because we think we know what we're doing, but really um, there's a Im big impact of this when it's a construction site. Okay, so this is the goal, of course. This is what we're trying to get to. And I'm messing with you a bit at this point in the day. This is not a natural reference site. You might think it is, and that would be great if you did think this was a natural, never armored site. This is, in fact, another stretch of shoreline at Seahurst Park where armor was removed in 2005. So some time has passed and, oh my gosh, isn't that cool? It's a messy beach with overhanging vegetation and some rack and some logs. And so I'm going to go back in time in this. I originally had it going forward in time, but going backward in time, this is 2019. This is in 2006. And so this stretch of armor was removed in 2005. Um, it looks more manicured. It's a really great site. And, you know, even looking at this, you can see like some subtle engineering going on there. Uh, there's that fence along the top part there, and there's a path behind that. So the feeder bluff isn't truly connected in all shapes and forms. Um, really important though at this site is there's enough of a span there, enough of a beach width going up into uh, the land where this shoreline has evolved to be a bit messy, which is great. And it's much more messy than this. So this is that stretch of armor before it was removed. Okay, photos are awesome because they're out there in the world is what we're looking at as opposed to our computers. Um, so I'm gonna merge now into talking about science and give you an example from another field study. And then after that, broadening out to the bigger picture stuff. And so Hannah had a similar slide to this, which is great. I think I've been showing this slide for like 15 years, uh, which hopefully doesn't mean I'm getting old, but probably does. Anyway, uh, I like to think of this all the time. So what is the role of science in restoration? So prior to restoration, look around for data to inform your goals. And as a restoration practitioner, hopefully you're able to incorporate that data into your project design. That's really, um, that's your moment to shine right there. And so us who are monitoring restoration, we're re really looking at what works and also what doesn't, or maybe what doesn't work, but what could be done better next time. And so this should be a feedback loop. And I think this is a big reason of why we're here today, at least for the natural science, representing natural scientists and hopefully incorporating more social science into this feedback loop. Okay, so let's talk about a study. And this is another one from the 2016 field season. That was a fun field season. I feel like that's when a lot of us started working together and collaborating more. And I can't remember why. I think we just started showing up at the same beaches. Um, for this particular project, we had Washington Sea Grant funding. And so the take on this project was, OK, it takes a long time to monitor a site before and after restoration through time. What can we do in one year? And so we did a space for time substitution. And so. We went out at 10 different locations around Puget Sound, shown in the map here. And again, we sampled three strata that you've seen similarly in Hannah and Megan's and Bianca's talk, where we look at a restored site, an armored site, and a reference site. And so these, all the restored sites had already been restored and the average age as of that field season was four years. They'd been restored a range of one to 11 years. Okay, so we went out and we did a bunch of monitoring and collaborated with a bunch of groups. And we got to this point of analyzing all the data. And I'll spend a bit of time on this graph because when you're a scientist, you get all this data, it's awesome. And then you have to like analyze it and you generate just all these figures and tables, right? That are really important to understand what's going on. And there was some great training before the summit here on like how to make your data and your visuals more appealing to a broader group of people. And so I tried that for the slide and let's see if it works. I made this fun Tetris shape and important to look at the colors. So the colors are color coded. And so lighter blue to medium blue to darker blue means significantly, significantly more or less of something. And that's the statistics saying that. And so if we look at beach rack here in the upper area, armored strata, had significantly less measurements of, of their, a variety of things, of percent beach rack and depth and width. And it was significantly less than restored in reference strata. Okay, 
So beach rack seems to come in pretty quickly. Logs and riparian vegetation for these 10 locations, we did not see a restoration effect. It was still grouped with armored and reference beaches had more. And that kind of makes sense, right? Driftwood moves around a lot in the winter storms and vegetation takes a while to grow. Okay, so rack invertebrates like this beach hopper amphipod and terrestrial insects living along shore were kind of in the middle. And so um, again, for these sites that had been restored for an average of four years, uh, we saw a signature there. We saw measurements higher than armored strata, but not quite up to reference yet. So I'll pause quickly. I hope that uh, Tetris piece made sense, but also to say quickly why we monitored these things. And this links back to the armor study that Megan mentioned. These are things on the beach that are usually directly impacted by armor placement. They're pretty up high on the beach and we can get to them with boots on the beach. We sampled all this by land. Um, they're important habitat features. And also in the cases of the invertebrates and the insects, these can be really good fish and bird food. And that gives a link for the insects, especially to Chinook salmon and juvenile Chinook salmon feeding along these shorelines. Okay, that was fun for me. That was a big study and it's uh, hopefully that made sense. And I'll show you one, one more typical graph that I think may be my only one in this talk, talking about restoration trajectories. And so again, the number of years restored as of that field season was one to 11 shown along the horizontal axis. And when we looked at just the restored sites and looked at a bunch of our measurements, we found a few that showed a trajectory. Not all of them did, most of them didn't. They either had gotten restored or weren't there yet. Um, I'm showing you here insect taxa richness. So a measurement of the diversity of the insects that we're sampling there. And you can see a nice line that is increasing through time. And so we're trying to get a handle on this better and um, definitely the pre and post project monitoring as we go through time should hopefully inform this more. Okay, so I'm gonna broaden out here at this point and take an intermission. This is my intermission slide and my main key message of this talk. So if you remember nothing else, we've looked at a lot of the data and shoreline restoration projects are effective at initially improving upon armored shorelines and with time may reach natural conditions. That's the goal. And we just need to get more information on that. Two minutes, Jason. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna broaden out here and talk about organization. And I'll go through these slides a bit quick just because these are efforts just meant to organize. Um, a number of us started looking at any sites where monitoring had been occurring. And you see a mess of names here. There's a lot more being monitored even since 2016. So get a hold of me if you know of a site being monitored that might not be on that list. Um, and also this database. So Bianca talked about this and I think another speaker did. And so this was the shoreline monitoring toolbox that we're merging into a database and as a resource to get all this data together from different groups, have it talk to each other. And it also gives it data longevity. Uh, so check that out if you want. Here's a slide showing the seven protocols that have a database feature up there at this point. And our postdoc, Simone de Roche, is also a talented artist. And so there's at least some pretty watercolors up there that you can check out. And we'll be expanding this in the next, in the next year or two with NTA funding to broaden this database. So if you know of a good one to add, please let me know. OK, so let's wrap up. What do we still need to learn? And I mentioned the time frame needed to reach natural conditions. And it can be messy. And I'm pulling a graph here from the literature. This is not people around here, these are some other scientists who are looking at trajectories through time. And a lot of people have thought a lot about this and it's all over the place, right? Like not everything we're measuring on beaches follows a nice linear line. It can be messy, right? And so as we get more information, it will be important to link to the literature and thoughts that are out there already so we can set our goals appropriately. Okay, the second one is the response of specific habitat features. So if you look, at the Clancy et al. Uh, conceptual models, armor removal is one, and there's some other ones, planting of vegetation, sediment nourishment, log addition. We've talked about some of these today, and it's important to link all these together, and hopefully with a bunch of collaborators in the database, we can pull out some more information. And the last one is the response of different shore types. So we've seen some case study examples today at feeder bluffs at different shore types. And so 
we can hopefully learn more about this. Feeder bluffs, accretions, shore forms, pocket beaches, transport zones, they probably matter, right? And hopefully we'll be able to get to that point. And with that, I'll say thank you and hopefully take some questions and thank a bunch of our co-authors and main collaborators and funders on what I talked about today. Awesome, Jason, thanks so much. Uh, we've got time for questions, uh, maybe even a little bit of extra time because you are the last presentation in this fabulous day that we've had. Um, before uh, Lindsay starts getting to the questions, I just wanted to quickly say those um, pieces of art are amazing. Uh, wow, wow. That's I awesome. Just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's re really cool. So thanks for sharing those. So it looks like we've got some questions. Yeah, we have one question from Andrea um, regarding restoration trajectories. Is there a standard or consensus for how long to wait before monitoring following restoration implementation? So lag times could be related to both the scale of the impact, for example, the armor that was removed, construction disturbance, the energy of the site. Long-term monitoring seems super important in this context and better understanding how long it takes different sites to recover following restoration. Right, great question and a lot in there and all those things matter. And so for the data we've looked at around the Salus Sea, um, there seems to be that after five years, somewhere around there, that you get more of a restoration signature in the data. Um, and some things definitely happen quicker than that, like beach rack. And so um, we'll hopefully get more on that. It's just, we haven't been monitoring a lot of beaches longer than five years. Sears Park is one of the few. And so I think somewhere in that five to seven time, year time frame is a sweet spot for around here. And if you look in the, in the literature, it's all over the place, you know, some, some um, responses take 30 years, you know, it just takes time. And hopefully uh, when we're having the summit 20 years from now and I'm retired, someone will figure that out. Those are the only questions we've got to, sh oh wait, there's one more from Diane. Do you have much data on forage fish information for restored shorelines? We do, and I'm not the one. Um, so there's two sides for that. One is the eggs on the beaches. And so WDFW, of which Hannah Faulkner is associated with, um, leads up a lot of that. And there's a bunch of groups around the sound sampling for forage fish eggs for spawning on the beaches. Um, and if you're talking about fish swimming around, there's some scattered information. We need to do a better job getting that together. Tessa mentioned this morning, a project where uh, some synthesis of data will occur. And maybe that's um, something we can connect the dots with on that and pulling together beach stain data from around the sound, maybe even getting into the database so we can answer that question better. I could quickly add that for some case studies that I can remember, I know up in the North Strait, Northwest Straits world, um, I can't remember which, but Cornet Bay and Bowman Bay, it was either it's two years after restoration or five years after restoration. I can't remember which site that was associated with, but that's when they found um, eggs on the beach. That graph you showed um, of the time since uh, restoration, Jason, was really cool. Um, I, I don't know if that was from Lee uh, at all or from a sneak peek from your um, one year paper in revision, but that was exciting to see. Cool. It's a sneak peek. And, uh huh. I thought so. Um, yeah. Awesome. It'll get out someday. It's in, you know, with COVID, everything takes longer. And one of them is definitely a review uh, for peer reviewed literature, in my humble experience. So someday, mm -hmm. hopefully, they'll get out. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, and Lisa Kaufman just clarified uh, uh, five years at both Bowman Bay and Cornet Bay. So, oh, great. It was, uh, oh yeah. And Anna, Anna Toledo said the same thing. So, cool. cool. Do you want one more, Tish? One more question? Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Hugo asks, have you seen any correlation between shoreline restoration and upland urbanization? We haven't. And again, I think we will hopefully be able to answer that with, um, with Simone, our postdoc. It's great having postdocs. So that's on the laundry list for when we wave our magic statistical wand and analyze all the data up in the shoreline monitoring database to look at shore types such as feeder bluffs, accretion 
shore forms and all that, but also broadening out and looking at the landscape um, upland. And I think we should hopefully be able to import some of that as variables in our models. Awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, because it's the end of the day and we everyone was so good at staying on time and uh, my wrap up is going to be basically thanking everyone. Uh, we can do one more question uh, here from Stephanie. Oh wait, I lost it. Um, yes, Stephanie asks, have you included looking at shoreline restoration in estuarine habitats? That's next week, right? Uh, <laughs> deltas. <laughs> the delta shore form. Um, yes, people are looking at that. And gosh, let's try to connect the dots between all these. But yeah, deltas tune in next week, Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah, yeah. It's a great, a great tee up. Um, so with that, you guys, I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of our speakers for coming today and um, answering our crazy questions that we pose to every single one of our invited speakers. And, and we really just appreciate the diversity of perspectives and uh, different um, every, everything that every speaker brings to this conversation. We really value it. And we also really value the attention and, um, and uh, feedback and questions from all of you attendees. We, we are just so excited and thrilled uh, to see such great attendance today and um, keep it up, keep coming. We'll be back here tomorrow at 8.30 and then for the next two weeks, um, next week's will be all about deltaic short, short forms, uh, estuaries. And the week after that uh, will be about um, smaller embayments. And there's just a lot of really great work um, happening and we're excited to bring it all together. So uh, thanks so much everyone. For, for being helping, for being, being a part of this and uh, helping us to realize the vision for this summit. We know that there are so many things uh, uh, kind of pulling all of our attention and at, at all times right now. Uh, and so we're just um, so um, full of gratitude that everyone can, um, can help us um, bring this summit together. So thanks, thanks all. And for a quick goodbye, maybe we can have everybody just turn on your videos and, and say goodbye Do a wave. See you in the morning. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. All who are able, um, give a wave and, uh, and I'm loving all of the notes in the chat from everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. This is really fun. And we've got a great lineup tomorrow, starting at, uh, starting at nine at eight 30, eight 30. So we're excited to see you all for beaches part two tomorrow.